Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this meeting of South Cambridgeshire District Council's Planning Committee. My name is Councillor Henry Batchelor, and I'm the regular vice chair of the committee. Um, but members, we had a recent change in chair. Councillor Pippa Halings stepped down from the role and Councillor Peter Fain took the role on. Um, obviously, Peter Fain is not here today, he sent his apologies, so I'll be sitting in the chair as the vice chair. But what that does mean, members, we do need to appoint uh, a temporary vice chair for this meeting. I've asked Councillor Judith Ripith if she would mind taking that on and she's uh, willingly agreed. So, <laughs> members, is it acceptable to everyone that Councillor Ripith takes the vice chair for the meeting? Agreed. Thank you. Councillor Ripith, if you'd care to join us at the front. Um, I would like to thank Councillor Pippa Halings actually for her time in the chair. Um, it's quite a very demanding, time consuming role, and she did it very ably and very professionally. And I, you know, from the committee, I do thank her for her time in the role. Okay, just a bit of housekeeping, members, and then we'll get started. Uh, members, please note that every Sorry, those present in the council chamber, please note that everything on your desks, including your laptop screen, is likely to be broadcast at some point. The camera follows the microphone after it's switched on, so councillors and officers are requested to wait a few seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up with the microphone. Uh, please ensure you have switched off or silenced any devices you have so that they do not interrupt proceedings. And if the fire alarm sounds, please do leave the chamber and make your way down the stairs. Do not use the elevator. The safe assembly point is next to the marketing suite halfway down the business park. Can those participating in the meeting via the live stream please indicate you wish to speak via the chat column. Please do not use the chat column for any other purpose other than indicating a, um, a desire to speak. Please make sure your device is fully charged and that you switch off your microphone unless you're invited to do so otherwise. When you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone and camera are switched on. When you, finished, when you are finished addressing the meeting, please turn off your microphone and camera immediately. Speak slowly, clearly, and please do not interrupt or talk over anyone else. Members, please note if we need to vote on any item, we'll be doing so using the microphones in front of us. Only members that are present in the room are able to vote. Uh, okay, committee members, and I'm gonna take a roll call. So members, I'll call your name if you could Turn your mic on, wait a few seconds to introduce yourselves, please. So as mentioned, my name is Councillor Henry Batchelor. I'm one of the councillors for Linton, and I'm the usual vice chair of this committee and the uh, temporary vice chair for today, Councillor Ripeth. Good morning, um, temporary vice chair today and a local member, sorry, Councillor Judith Ripeth, local member for Milton and Water Beach Ward. Thank you, Councillor Anna Bradnam. Thank you, Chairman. I'm Councillor Anna Bradnam another local member for Milton and Water Beach Ward. Thank you very much. Councillor Dr. Martin Kahn. Um, hello, uh, Councillor Dr. Martin Kahn, uh, one of the members for Histon, Impington and Orchard Park. Thank you, Councillor Joyce Hales. <laughs> Thank you, Joyce Hales from Melbourne. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Jeff Harvey is planning to be with us, albeit I understand he's running a few minutes late, so he will be joining us shortly. Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Timmy Hawkins, uh, member for Caldicott Ward. Thank you, Councillor Deborah Roberts. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Deborah Roberts, District Councillor for the Foxton Ward. Thank you, Councillor Heather Williams. Good morning, everybody. My name's Heather Williams, and I represent the Mordens Ward. Thank you, Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. Thank you, Jay. Good morning. I'm Richard Williams. I'm the member for uh, Whittlesford, Triplo, Heathfield, and Newton. Thank you. And finally, Councillor Eileen Wilson. Um, good morning. Thank you. Um, Councillor Eileen Wilson, member for Cottenham and Rampton Ward. Thank you. So we have a quorum meeting member, so we'll be proceeding today. Um, we also supporting the committee today. We have some officers in the room with us. On my left, Stephen Kelly, who's the Joint Director of Planning. Stephen. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. We have uh, Mike Huntington, who's a Principal Planner. Mike. Good morning, everybody. Thank you. And... Stephen Reid, who's our legal officer. Um, morning, Chair. Morning, members. Thank you very much. And also joining us online, we have our Democratic Services Officer, Lawrence Damari Homan, who will be clerking the meeting today. Morning, Chair. Yep. Lawrence Damari Homan, Democratic Services Officer. Um, morning to all our members and officers. And thank you to our members of the public who are taking the time to speak to us today. Thank you very much. Okay, members, uh, if you need to leave the meeting at any point, do indicate to me so that can be recorded in the minutes, if you would, please. 
Uh, we'll be taking regular breaks throughout the day, dependent on where we are in the agenda. But if any members do need a break, please do indicate to me and we'll do our best to accommodate. Thank you. OK, members, we should have um, our main agenda pack, plus also a supplementary document that uh, I believe we have paper copies of in front of us as well as electronically. Um, if members feel they're short of any documentation at any time, again, do indicate and we will do our best to make sure you're up to date. OK, members. Given the nature of the application we have in front of us today, I would like to propose two motions to you, if you would. Um, and those are the same motions I proposed at the last meeting, where we looked at the first North Star application, phase 3A. Um, and one of those is to, given the high level of public interest in this and the, um, and the number of public speakers we've had register, I would like to put a motion that we allow all public speakers who have registered to address the committee before us today. Um, so I'll propose that. Councillor Heather Williams, do you second? Yes, Chair, I'll second that. Thank you very much. Members, is, can we do that by affirmation? Agreed. Great, thank you very much. Um, and second motion is the same one that we put forward last time, which I thought worked quite well, and that's how we structure the debate today. So uh, usually we don't have questions of clarification for officers until during the debate, but given that there's quite a lot of information in front of us, some of it detailed, uh, I would like to offer members the chance after the officer's presentation to ask any questions of clarification. Um, also then, I would like to try and group the sections in the report when we get to the debate so that we're a bit more focused in our, in our discussion rather than jumping from one point to another. Um, so they will be sections one and two, which is principle of development, land use and parameter plans. Then section three, access and transport. Then sections four, five, six, which is employment assessment, housing delivery, and social and community infrastructure. And finally, sections seven to 10, which are environmental considerations, cumulative impact, uh, financial obligations, and the planning balance. Sorry, Chair, could you just give us, you whisk through those so quickly, I'd just like to mark them up. Could you just give Sections one and again? two. One and two, yeah. Three. Three. Four, five, six. Four, five, six. And finally, seven to 10. Seven to 10, thank you very much, Chair. Okay, so I would like to propose that motion to the committee, please. Would anyone care to second? Councillor Williams? Happy to second, Chair. Thank you, members. Are members in agreement? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you very much. Okay, with that, then, we'll move on to agenda item two, which is apologies. Lawrence, please. Thank you, Chair. We've received apologies for absence from Councillor Pippa Halings and Councillor Peter Fane. And their subs are? Apologies. Um, so, Councillor Joyce Hales and Councillor Anna Bradnam have substituted today. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Declarations of interest, members. Do any members have any interest to declare pecuniary or otherwise? I don't see any. Obviously, if members... Sorry, Councillor Heather Williams. Um, just to say, I think last time um, the Greater Cambridge Partnership came up, so just in, in case it does again, yep. um, that I'm a member of the Greater Cambridge Partnership Assembly. Great, thank you. I think that's noted. Okay, well, members, if any other interests become um, clear to you while the meeting is going on, please do indicate, and we'll take those then. Okay, with that, we'll move on to the substantive item on our agenda today, which is item four, which begins on page five of the printed agenda, and the application is North Stowe Phase 3B on Station Road in Long Stanton. <coughs> Excuse me. The proposal in front of us is an outline planning application for the development of North Stowe Phase 3B, which comprises of up to 1,000 homes, a primary school, secondary mixed use zone with associated infrastructure around it. The applicant is Homes England. We have a raft of key material considerations that we need to discuss today, which are detailed in the agenda. Uh, the reason it is in front of us today is because it is a large strategic site within the district. And the planning officer who will be presenting it to us today is on the screen in front of us now, Mr. Paul Ricketts. Paul, good morning. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members. Good morning, everyone. So if you'd like to yeah, introduce your report and then hold on the line for any questions or clarification, if you would, please. Thank you. Will do. As you can see, I'm the case officer for the planning application. Um, it is as described by the chair, but I'll read it out now. The application is, for, is in outline and has been submitted by Homes England for permission 
for the development of North Stow Phase 3B, comprising up to a thousand homes, a primary school, a secondary mixed use zone, which will include the following uses, retail and associated services, food and drink, community, leisure, employment and residential uses. There's also approval requested for open space and landscaped areas, engineering and infrastructure works. All matters of details in terms of appearance, landscaping, layout, scale and access are reserved for further submission and approval. This application is subject to an environmental impact assessment and has been underpinned by three parameter plans and the site plan. Phase 3B is edged in red, is approximately 47 hectares in site and is located to the northwest of North Stowe, Newtown, Phase 1. The site is bounded to the north by the Cambridgeshire Guided Busway. To the east, immediately adjoining, are the approved Digital Park and Endurance Estates development schemes. Further east is the Long Stanton Cambridgeshire Guided Busway station. The B1050 bounds the site to the south. Beyond is the northern edge of the village of Long Stanton. The surrounding area is predominantly occupied by farmland to the north, west and southwest of the site. The application is accompanied with the following parameter plans, land use, movement and building heights. These will now be taken in turn. Open space will be provided at the northern edge with the guided busway and to the west with adjoining farmland. There will be a central area of open space focused on the existing central copse and hedgerow. A secondary mixed use zone shown hatched is proposed north of the primary school location, which is shown by the star. The residential uses, coloured grey, are located throughout the site. There is proposed to be a single vehicle access point in the north, in the south, sorry, in the southeastern part of the site from the roundabout junction of the B1050 Station Road. Land is safeguarded to allow potential access for emergency vehicles, pedestrian and cyclists to the east into phase one. This is shown by the orange arrows. Pedestrian and cycle links and access are proposed throughout the site, again shown in orange uh, arrows to the north and to the east, the adjoining digital park and endurance estates residential schemes. The building heights within phase 3B will be predominantly two and three storeys. Two, these are shown in yellow. A two storey zone is proposed along the southeastern edge with phase one. The southern edge of B1050 will be up to three storeys. It is envisaged to provide different heights here to help with eligibility. There will be two areas within the scheme that will be up to four storeys in height. A set piece green space shown in the orange circle and then more rectangular secondary mixed use zone close, close to the school. Site density is proposed at an overall 40 dwellings per hectare. This will be achieved using best practice urban design principles to ensure variety, interest and the sense of place. The development will secure a range of financial and non-financial contributions to ensure that the scheme is policy compliant. Key deliverability here is the affordable housing at 40% of dwellings. The planning benefits from the application proposal have been evaluated as set out in paragraphs 567 to 589 of the main report. These are primarily economic, social, and environmental benefits. Officer recommendation is that we that the committee agree a delegated approval to the Joint Director of Planning and Economic Development of Outline Permission 20 forward slash 02142 forward slash out as amended subject to the planning conditions and section 106 planning obligations as set out in the committee report and amendment update sheet. This finishes my presentation, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, members, as mentioned at the start, we now have an opportunity for any questions of clarification for the case officer. Um, equally, it's probably worth noting we also have a representative from the Highways Department on the line and also a member from the Environment Agency on the line as well, should we have any technical questions that are better placed, better directed to them. So, uh, members, yeah, over to you for any questions of clarification for the officers. Councillor Bratton, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I wanted to ask um, two questions. One is on 
heads of terms on page 111, um, there's reference to um, village traffic, uh, it just says village traffic schemes, initial payment at, at, for design of £10,000. But I just wanted to check how many villages does that refer to? Uh, and is it all of the surrounding villages or just one? Um, and does it, is it referring to the villages outside or, or the town itself? I think it's the villages outside. And there's another question. Um, is, well, it, I, if you feel this strays into debate, that's fine, I'll ask it in debate. But I just wanted to ask, there does seem to be a, a conflict of view between for example, this, what the Swavesey Internal Drainage Board has said about what's adequate with drainage, and elsewhere the Lead Local Flood Authority and the Environment Agency have said. And I just wanted to know whether we've got any clarification about which of those is to be relied upon. Okay, well, I think the first one's best, the first question, sorry, is best placed, uh, put to Tam Parry from Highways, who I believe is on the line. Tam, good morning. Hi. Good, good oh, morning, uh, everyone. Oh, you're there. Okay. Did, yeah. you, did you manage to catch that question? Um, I, I did, thank terms. you. Yes. Yes. So it, it does refer to um, 11 villages around North Day, um, and the money split into two portions. One for the design. Oh, sorry, sorry Tam, one, one second. Sorry. sorry, Tam. We've had a request for an increase in volume. Yeah. Okay, Tam, sorry, as you were. Sorry, is that better? Yes, it is. Good. Um, yeah, so the money ref, um, is split into two uh, segments, but it's for 11 villages around Norstow. And there's a design sum and then a sum for measures themselves. So between phase 3A and 3B, there's 900,000 in total for traffic calming in surrounding villages. So my aim is to get the money for the design early on. So but on um, page 111, it refers to village traffic calming schemes in the plural, and it refers to £180,000. But then in the comments, it says village traffic schemes initial payment for design of 10000 So does that refer to 11 villages? So that is... Um, the design money so that we can work with the villages to see what they need. Um, so that would be an initial sum and then the, the remaining 180 would follow. Sorry, but that is for 11 villages? In uh, other words, yes. rather less than a thousand? Uh, yes, I, I, I can't find page 111 or at least the 111 I'm looking at is different to yours. Yeah. It's the third page of the Heads of Terms. Okay, I'll do my best to find that. Appendix um, B, Tam, if that helps. That, that does help. Let me, um, whilst you carry on to the next item, if you like, shall I just find that and then dig it out? And yes, please, if you come could, back Tam. To it. Um, okay, we'll take your second question about the uh, difference of views between the various drainage authorities. I think Mr Kelly's going to take that one. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, we've got um, the IDB here to speak later on, and obviously there are questions to, to them. Uh, there is a, uh, an objection from the IDB. There isn't an objection from the Environment Agency uh, and the Lead Local Flood Authority. I think it's probably a matter for debate rather than clarification at the moment. I think it's probably helpful to hear from the IDB uh, and indeed the applicants on this before we um, uh, discuss it further. That's fine. Thank you. I'll save it for debate. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams, please, and then Hawkins. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think it's safe to talk now. Um, it was just, if we could have perhaps a slide up again, because one of the things that lots of local members are, are raising is around the heights along the B1050, I believe. So just wondering, because it's quite difficult. The colours are very, very similar. Um, on things. So if, if we could just have highlighted where the two-storey buildings are, in essence. Is this the diagram that's this? So I don't know who's sharing that, Lawrence or Paul, if you could just maybe indicate 
roughly where the two-story buildings will be? It, it's, it is in the yellow uh, chair, remember? So where yeah. the indication is, is so along the B1050, going a bit too high there, Lawrence. But it's where the yellow is. So there's two different colours here. The yellow, predominantly, well, I'm calling it yellow. You may call it something else. And then there's like an orangey peach. So there's two in to the two areas that, that that rectangular, and then the circle is four stories, up to four stories, and the rest is two to three stories. Does that help? I hope. I think Mr. Kelly wants to come in on this as well. Uh, yes, so so the vast majority of the sites, fair to say, is up to three storeys. Um, and what you perhaps doesn't come across so well in our screens uh, is that the area bounding um, the uh, previously built phase one development that you can see in the bottom right hand corner, um, both the northern side of that and the western side, so where that red cursor is now, are uh, two storeys. Uh, and then um, the two uh, kind of... <coughs> browner, darker colour areas are up to four storeys, but um, hopefully that's helpful. The area along the um, 1050 is three up to three storeys um, uh, in terms of its form, which is where obviously you've seen comments in the report uh, where people are concerned about that. Thank you, Tam. I saw you appeared a few seconds ago. Are you ready to respond to the question from Councillor Bradnam? Yes. Yeah, so the the, the money from phase 3B works very much together with the money from phase 3A and from everything I understand from the applicant, phase 3B is following from 3A. So we've got 40,000 from 3A for the design work with villages and 10,000 from 3B for the design work with villages. So, so that, that sum of 10,000 is correct. Okay. 10,000 is for 3B? Yes. It's right. for 3B, yeah. Yes. Thank you, Tam. Okay. Um, next question of clarification, Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins, but before it's probably worth noting, Councillor Harvey's now joined us, and that was at 10.20, just for the minutes. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair, through you. Um, actually, my question kind of relates to the first question that Councillor Bradnam asked, and it's on paragraph 441 um, on page 76 which talks about uh, impact of surface water arrangement being undertaken and agreed with the IDB, the EA, and the LLFA. But then there's objections from the IDB. So, I'm sorry, I just had this big question mark on this paragraph. I don't understand what it's talking about. So, paragraph 441, page 76. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think there are two issues here, the, the, um, uh, and um, the IDB uh, are here this, this morning. I think in terms of the, the surface water scheme, so the scheme for uh, designing surface water discharge, I think um, there is broad agreement about the system that's being proposed. Uh, I think where the uh, fundamental... Um, uh, there, there is a question mark about whether that surface water disposal, normally you hold water onto a site um, to uh, manage runoff rates. But I think the um, uh, hydrology of the um, Swavesy drain is such that there's a question about whether or not it's better to actually discharge water faster whilst those other effectively held bodies of water elsewhere that <laughs> feed into the Swavesy drain um, happen. Um, I think the purposes of the drainage conditions are to try and manage that um, discussion and, and the further design process. Where the IDB um, differ, I think, and the basis for their objection, I'm sure Mr. Wildspin can help you when he, he gives his presentation, um, uh, is in the issues surrounding Utton Strove and the consequences for foul water treatment for the management of the waters in the Swavesy drain. So I think that's the, that's the reason for the, for the difference at this moment in time. Okay, thank you for that. Next question from Councillor Khan, please. The question for Tam, really. Um, it's about, uh, about highways. 
the uh, proposal is for a single access off a roundabout, which is at the, uh, on the B150, nearly at the, the main north slow end of, of the development. There's also another roundabout at the other end. Um, I just wondered what the considerations were and why they had chosen not to have two accesses, and including an access, direct access to the, the roundabout, which might provide, for those people that are using a car, a more act, a direct access and uh, produce less traffic. I just wondered what the considerations are. I can see the ones plus and minus, and I just wondered how you, why you thought about that. OK. Well, Tam's appeared on our screen, so hopefully he'll be able to respond to that. Uh, fingers crossed. Um, yes, we did uh, discuss that with the applicants, um, but where the first roundabout it is, which I think is the, the one you mean to the, the left hand side of the, the site, um, that's not actually the land between there and the site isn't within the ownership of the applicant. So it wasn't possible for them to put a vehicle of access from that roundabout into the site. So that's why there's just the, the, the one access from the roundabout proposed. In terms of the internal layout, um, would it be possible to provide provisions so that one could perhaps be put at a future date if it were deemed necessary? That wouldn't be outlined, but I just... I don't think the parameter plan allows for that because um, the parameter plan is, is has a, an area of green area to the left-hand side, I think, so I think that's ruled out. Okay, I think, Mr. I think Mr. Kelly does want to have a brief comment as well. Uh, hello. Uh, yes, just to ju just just to highlight that obviously the current parameter boundaries of Phase Three B are consistent with your local plan policy. The area of land that Tam refers to is outside of the local plan boundary for the development, and obviously would be a departure to bring that land forward. Um, from your local plan, and I think that's the uh, reason why the parameter plans at this stage would not reflect, because they would imply an extension of your local plan, which isn't necessary in our view, but um, obviously limits the access options as well as the site. Thank you for that. And we have Councillor Richard Williams, please. Thank you, <coughs> Thank you Chair. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, they are slightly dependent on each other. Um, <clears throat> the first is, it, it concerns the hydrology and, and particularly the, the, the impact on the River Terrace deposit. The representation we've got from Long Stanton um, notes the, the one to two metre drop in groundwater levels, but, but it notes also that the baseline data uh, that that's calculated from dates from a time after dewatering of North Stowe. So my, my first question for clarification is, is it therefore the case that that one to two metre drop that I think we talked about in the, in the other application we dealt with um, on this site relatively recently is on top of the dewatering? And if so, uh, could we get some figures on the total level of fall in the um, um, water line on, in, on the River Terror to deposit as between its natural state and what it will be afterwards? Um, and then I think that the environmental impact assessment seems to regard the impact as, as not significant, although I'm not sure it looked specifically at the um, impact on the River Terrace deposit. So could we get a bit of clarification as to what exactly the environmental impact says about this and whether it in fact looked at it at all? Thank you. Thank you. I think we're going to come to Mr Kelly first and then we'll probably throw over to the Environment Agency after that. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, so the, so the significance in terms of the environmental impact assessment, it did look at the underlying ground conditions in this site, which are different to the case for 3A in terms of the boundaries of um, the river terrace deposits. And the river terrace deposits in this part of the site, I understand, are uh, in a different um, relationship with the ground so that they're, um, uh, they're in cases deeper. What the um, uh, application uh, and environmental assessment has done is it considered monitoring, it's currently undertaking monitoring of groundwater levels uh, in, uh, on the site. Uh, and um, they have produced a piece of uh, a report that was a supplement to the planning application that discusses effectively the implications for, for groundwater. Their conclusions at this moment in time is partly because 
Um, only approximately 40% of the site is underlain by the river terrace deposits. The whole western end uh, is not. Uh, and the depth of those river terrace deposits are different. They're, between, they're, they're much closer to the surface in relation to three uh, into phase one and, and elsewhere. They're a bit deeper in this um, case. They do come relatively close to the surface. Uh, is that um, the impact will be less significant uh, and it certainly won't extend beyond the, per, the boundaries of site 3A, uh, sorry, 3B. What the um, uh, conditions propose uh, on the basis of that, and uh, you know, Mr. Ireland might be able to comment from the Environment Agency, but what the uh, conditions propose is based on existing monitoring, and I know there's a, some comments have been made about, well, is that monitoring information up to date and so on, but based upon uh, the existing monitoring that is pre-development, any implications from dewatering will then be able to be assessed. Uh, and um, although it's quite, the, the ground is quite impermeable, uh, and the um, water uh, flood risk assessment, the water assessment concludes that the conveyance of a lot of that water from that impermeable area away from the site in formal surface water drainage will limit the amount of recharge of the groundwater aquifer. There is a, um, uh, there is a uh, perceived limited impact of that beyond the, beyond the site boundaries. And as I said, there is an a monitoring regime in place to make sure that any dewatering and the implications on groundwater and the river terrace deposits is, is addressed. I don't know if Mr. Ireland can, can comment further. I'm sure the applicants will also be able to give further clarity on this when they speak. Sure. Adam, good morning. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, members. Morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, any, yes. Any I'm, comments um, on that particular point? Um, I was uh, nodding as uh, Mr. Kelly was was speaking there, really, in terms of uh, it being a lot different to the the three A site that we discussed the other um, the other week, um, notably in terms of the hydrogeological connectivity between um, the various deposits uh, across the wider area. Um, and it very much uh, is is in more more in uh, in isolation, and hence the uh, the conditioning requirements for the uh, the monitoring on on the site itself. Um, but no, Mr. Kelly is, uh, is correct in terms of uh, his assessment there, um, and in terms of the um, yes, the ongoing uh, monitoring, um, and obviously addressing that through the conditions going forward. So I couldn't remember. Does that cover your questions or no? Well, I, it was all very helpful, very useful. I don't think I got an answer to the two direct questions I asked, but whether it is the case that that fall in the water, because I know the, those comments do relate to 3A, I'm absolutely right about that. Does that apply to 3B, that the one to two metre drop would be from the dewatering level or not? Or, or does that not apply to 3B, it only applies to 3A? Um, I don't think, in fact, for the purposes of, uh, Mike might correct me, for the purposes of this environmental assessment, um, they make the same conclusions as they do for the previous 3A. One of the important distinctions between this site and 3A is that, in fact, the groundwater and water flows in a different direction. So the water flows uh, northwestwards from all of 3B, uh, and it flows in a different direction. Location. I think the previous report that was referred to an accompanied application for 3A indicated a one to two metre impact from dewatering. Uh, in this case, because the river terrace deposits are, uh, are deeper, there's a question mark about whether there will be a need for dewatering in quite the same way, um, because of, um, it, the level river terrace deposits go down to around five metres before you hit them. Uh, and, and so my understanding is that um, there isn't a forecast of a reduction in, in groundwater levels, although um, perhaps it's a question to ask the, um, one of the speakers who is the drainage specialist for the applicant when they, when they um, speak. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we have Councillor Wilson, please. Richard. Thank you, Chair. Richard. Um, Mike. Mike. Um, I'm looking at um, paragraph 331 on page 58 about the gypsy and traveller provision at new communities. And it says that um, an assessment was carried out in 2016 and that identified no need for gypsy and traveller pitches during the plan period. But we've seen several times year after year um, um, unauthorised encampments setting up and people and travellers and gypsies being shunted from 
place to place, and I'm quite concerned that we're, we're saying that there's no need for, to make provision for them. Um, we, we had a, an encampment in our village last year, and it was quite distressing to the um, to the travellers themselves being pushed from pillar to post, and I wonder um, how no need was identified when this is something that happens on a, a regular as a regular occurrence. Thank you. Thank you. I think Mr. Kelly's going to take this one as well. Um, in relation to, to gypsy and traveller needs across the district as a whole, um, uh, the 2016 survey didn't identify a substantial need, partly because you might recall the government changed the definition um, as part of that needs assessment. We're in the process, delayed unfortunately by COVID at the moment, of identifying a need for the next local plan process. What our policies say for the accommodation of gypsy and traveller need uh, and obviously we'll work closely with the housing team once we get the study, uh, is um, that in certain circumstances, um, some of that need might be met on strategic sites uh, as well as in uh, locations across the district. At this moment in time, there's no policy requirement to make explicit allocation on the back of the needs assessment that we have. Uh, obviously, as um, I think the report sets out, this site is not expected to come forward until um, some time towards the end of the decade. Um, and obviously with working with the housing team on the housing mix and the housing needs, um, uh, we may well need to incorporate future need into either this or any of our other strategic sites. But right now there isn't a, an identified need um, that we would suggest and means that we need to safeguard land in this in this site. Do you want to come back? Or no, no, thank you for that explanation. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bradnam, no, I've got a question mark next to your name. Did you want to come back on anything? Or? Thank you, Chair. Um, I was refraining because of the suggestion that this would be better covered under debate, but I just wanted to clarify that there is a, a, um, a dis continuity, there's a disagreement in the report because in paragraphs 185 to 187, Swavis CIDB object to the application. That's on my paper, page 38. But in paragraphs 163 and 164, the lead local flood authority basically say it's okay. And in paragraph 175, the environment agency says it's okay. Uh, but then when you go on as Councillor Hawkins does, at paragraph 441, the IDB, the, the, there's this um, weird statement that, well, no, I'm sorry, it, it's a perfectly under, acceptable statement, but I don't understand it, that the IDB would prefer to see water discharged quickly. This is 441 paragraph. The IDB would prefer to see water discharged quickly into the Swaver Sea drain such that it can enter the River Grey 2 system in advance of peak flows. So presumably, what Mr. Kelly was saying, the peak flows would come when the suds basins were full. So what they're saying is initial surface water needs to go off into the drain so it can go out to the Grey 2s. But the problem is, and has always been, that at Webb's Hole Sluice, if the river is high because of the tide or because of prevailing weather conditions, it can't get out there. So I know there are monies in place to improve the Webb's Hole Sluice, but the concern would be, how is that going to work that, that the IDB would prefer to see it discharged quickly in conditions when it can go out, but what about when it can't go out? And then presumably the slower impact of water from the sud systems would come when it's been held on the land for a while. And I can see it says the Swavesey has generally, the Swavesey Internal Drainage Board has basically agreed that with the EA and the LFA. But it just, it says, um, should such a solution not be achieved due to, for example, the maintenance of the off-site watercourse, then it's proposed that existing greenfield runoff rates are currently, you know, are maintained. So there's a huge need to get this right, and I'm not sure I understand how it's intended to be done. There's a 
disagreement within the report about whether it's okay or not. I'm sorry, this is really kind of debatish stuff, but. I think Mr. Kelly's gonna come back. I think there are there are a number. Of, I mean, I think you might want to um, ask some of these questions to the applicants. But but in essence, you're you're right. There is broad consensus around the surface water drainage strategy between the IDB, EA, and uh, LLFA, uh, and the applicants, uh, and um, the conditions that I think we've put in in place seek to recognise that the decisions about whether it's rapid discharge or it's um, uh, effectively slowed discharge can be made uh, in due course. The, the difference between the LLFA, as I said earlier, and the EA and, um, uh, and the IDB relate fundamentally to concerns, I think, around foul water. So in this respect, in terms of surface water management, uh, there is um, broad agreement. You're right. There may well be investments required as part of the um, uh, surface water strategy for um, Webb's Hole Sluice as well as um, for the Swavesy Drain. Um, and that's a matter that the uh, IDB uh, and Angling Water and EA will need to explore as, as they go forwards. We can't offer certainty around any more certainty around that, and that's the purpose of the planning conditions, I think, is to try and make sure that that solution in due course is, is a solution that, that is addressed. The applicant can also set out how they're approaching this. Yeah, sorry, the applicant can also set out how they're approaching this with, with those parties um, if necessary. Because it, in here we know, don't we, and it repeats it in a number of places, but most notably in the reason for 33 surface water infrastructure works is, you know, we're not allowed to increase the risk of flooding downstream to, you know, by the virtue of any development we might or might not give approval for. So that's the concern, that if, if the drainage system was not able to um, release the water into the Great Ooze, that, that's the problem, isn't it? You know, well, I'm sure we'll... The, you're entitled to rely upon the advice of the agencies in this in this matter because it is a very technical um, uh, issue uh, and uh, what what the report highlights is that on this point there is unanimity in terms of there is a appropriate um, resolution to account I can see the conditions are very uh, comprehensive but it is worrying okay thank you Great. thank you for that and councillor Khan please A lot of the points were brought up, actually, in what uh, Councillor Bradham said, but uh, something that just worries me is the, um, the fact that the site is only four and a half metres above sea level, uh, which with the sea level range uh, 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 in wash, I think it's something around uh, between uh, five and seven metres, which means that you're not far off high tide level. Um, we're predicting uh, by the end of the century a uh, sea level rise of around a metre, maybe more. Uh, which means that uh, you're talking about reducing the, the groundwater level by one and a half metres, so perhaps two and a half metres. You're talking about quite a long period of time, actually, the uh, water levels, uh, the groundwater levels are, uh, are being below high tide level. Is there a question uh, of clarity? No, yeah, there is. Uh, the, qu the question I wanted to know is, at what, to what extent the, can, the problems of, high, uh, uh, of rising sea level and over what period of time the, the, the provision that's been made. You're talking about houses which are likely to last probably uh, 150 years. Um, you're talking, uh, therefore, problems in the future may be quite serious. Uh, uh, what, uh, it would be that the period of time in which you're unable to discharge could be really very long period of time if the tide level is uh, that much higher because you're raising the base level at which the river goes and therefore the period of time, the water backs up the river, uh, you're having more deposition problems of clearing the river. So I just wondered the extent to which that has been taken into account. Okay, I don't know who wants to take that one. Stephen or maybe Mr. Ireland. Adam, are you online? Hi. Sorry. Yeah, um, did you get that yes, around I... rising sea levels and had that been taken into your consideration? 
Um, it, it will have done in terms of the fact that the uh, the surface water drainage from the site itself, and again, hopefully the um, the applicants will be able to address this uh, later on as well. Uh, but there'll also be the requirement for the the surface water uh, surface water drainage system to uh, effectively consume its own smoke in terms of have sufficient capacity to deal um, to accommodate the uh, the volume uh, of flood water that comes from the impermeable areas to be discharged. Um, so within the site itself, there will be that need for um, for those appropriate areas and volumes of retention, um, also factoring in the issue of, of climate change as well. You're right in terms of the, the amount of, of uh, and the rates of discharge and uh, and also was alluded to by uh, Councillor Bradnam there as well, that there will be issues relating to how it's engineered in terms of how quickly we can get away. What's the what's the formal engineering which will be addressed, um, I believe that via the uh, via the conditions. Thank you for that, Adam. OK, members, that concludes all our questions of clarification for officers. So we'll now move. Stephen, do you want to come in? Sorry, Chair, just to say that as Councillor Harvey joined following the initial presentation, my recommendation is that he's not able to vote in relation to this matter. I suppose that's down to Councillor Harvey, ultimately, whether he does or not. But yeah, you've heard a recommendation, but you know, please do feel free to, to join in with the debate regardless. The, the presentation was relatively um, brief and Councillor Harvey didn't meet, miss very much of it and will have read most of it if he's read the mm -hmm. papers. I mean, it's completely up to Councillor Harvey whether he feels in a position to be able to vote on it or not. I trust him to make that choice himself. So yeah, welcome anyway, Jeff. Um, okay, with that, members, we'll move to our public speakers. Um, we will start with Mr. Keith Wilderspin, who's from the IDB. So all those questions we had a second ago might be, might be an opportunity to ask the IDB directly. Mr. Wilderspin, good morning. Good morning. So I think you're probably familiar with the process by now. Three minutes to uh, address the committee, and at the end of which, I'm sure there'll be some questions for yourself. So, if you wouldn't mind staying seated at the end, that'll be that'll be helpful. Thank you. Um, Swavesy IDB has responsibility for the drainage of the internal dis drainage district in Swavesy. We also manage the maintenance of the e Environment Agency drains in Swavesy, including the Upton Strove and Swavesy drains. We therefore believe we have the best understanding of the drainage system. Government planning policy is that cumulative impacts of flooding on local areas which are susceptible flooding should be taken into account. That advice from relevant flood risk authorities such as IDBs should be taken. With regard to proposed 3B, sorry, According to Joint EA South Council District Council Flood Risk Assessment Study, Swavesy has 195 properties at risk from flooding. With regard to the proposed 3B surface water discharge into the Swavesy drain, which joins the Great Ooze at Webb's Hole Sluice, please note that Webb's Hole Sluice can be closed for periods of up to four weeks on a regular basis. No discharge can be made at these times from the Swavesy area into the river. Therefore, any extra discharges of water from the development will impact on Swavesy village. This will obviously get worse with climate change. As a minimum, we believe that the North Stow 3B development should be conditioned in the same way as two sites in Swavesy village. This provides for on-site storage for the extra site generated volume of water while Webb's Hole Sluice is closed. The EA have agreed that a telemetry system for this will be installed at Webb's Hole Sluice. This telemetry has a capacity at, for six sites. The strategy on the two sites was conditioned by the Greater Cambridge Planning Authority and subsequently by a government inspector on dealing with appeals. Councillor Hawkins has knowledge of this condition. Adam Island, it appears, did not. Later this week, I have a site meeting to look at issues around the discharges into the Swavesy drain with the regional flood defence manager, and I believe Adam is, will be in attendance 
and also in attendance will be a member of the Regional Flood Defence Committee. The applicants gave assurances that a planning application would not be submitted before the IB, IDB had signed it off. There have been no meaningful discussions with the developers or their agents since January 2019. The Sustainability Officer and the Lead Local Authority have stated the IDB should agree with the discharge rate and the EA have expressed concerns about the proposed scheme. Members will have seen their objection doc document dated 18th of February 2021. I hope they will also have seen the document start dated the 19th of June 2020 and the 16th of July 2020. You start concluding, please. Sorry? If you could come to a conclusion, please. We believe the North Stowe 3B flood risk assessment is, is flawed. I expressed our concern with the foul water discharges from this site into the Swavesy volume limited channel. Stantec quoted that figure, not me, at the North Stowe 3A planning meeting on Friday the 28th of January. Note, please, th phase 3B houses were not modelled into the LDS 239 litres per second cap capacity. This needs to be addressed. Thank you. Are we near the end? In conclusion, we believe the drainage proposals from the developers are flawed and should be rejected until further work is done with consultation between developers, the EA, the Planning Authority and the IDB. The same was undertaken, undertaken on phases one, two and three of North Stowe to enable more sustainability proposals to be worked on. The extra flood risk to homes in Swaves is of grave concern. We believe far too important to leave to delegated powers. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Okay, members, questions or clarification for the IDB, Councillor Hawkins and then Bradnam. Uh, thank you, Chair, and through you. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, a couple of questions uh, for me at this point. You said that um, the sluice is closed for about four weeks. Is that four weeks? I mean, how often is, does this happen and why? It, it, it happens dependent on the river levels, the Great Ouse River levels. If the river levels are high, the sluice is closed and therefore the levels in the Swavesey coming into the, down the Swavesey catchment flood over the Swavesey area. And, and, and until that, those flood levels raise as high as they use, the doors can't open. So how often, until the use drops. Can you give me an example, say last year, 2021, how often that happened? Over the Christmas period, it happened on two occasions but both for, for approximately four weeks. The Environment Agency could give you the exact figures okay. of the opening and closing of the doors. Okay, so this is what causes the risk to the 195 houses, as you mentioned. Yeah. Second question for me is, um, there was this meeting that should have occurred, uh, which you said was agreed will take place. Have you been given any reason why it hasn't between all the organizations? I don't know. That wasn't that wasn't a, that wasn't a decision I could make. You um, we, we, we have pressed for 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 for, for these the, uh, meetings of all this these organisations, but they haven't happened. Thank you, Chair. Thank for you, now. <laughs> uh, Councillor Bradman, please. Thank you, Chair, and um, thank you very much, Mr. Wilderspin. Um, I also wanted to pick up on that. I wanted to understand what was the agreement you said that the developer said promised that they wouldn't submit the application until an agreement had been come to between the Swaver CIDB and the Lead Local Flood Authority and the Environment Agency. And can you just clarify again for us what that agreement was supposed to secure? The agreement was supposed to secure the fact that um, any discharges from this site wouldn't make matters worse in Swavesey. Um, the developers have, have taken the early discharge of water out of context. This was to be aligned with 
an exemplar management system of the Swavesey drain so that the waters could get out early, which, which isn't there at the moment, especially down at the um, discharge end near Webb's Hole. Mm -hmm. um, and we also said that once that discharge had taken place, because we could have further um, precipitations while the doors were closed, that the site should be capable of retaining yeah. all the water from that site until such time as the doors opened again. In other words, we wanted to clear as much water from the site as we could so that they didn't have to store all the original storm, but then the doors, then they wouldn't be able to discharge until the doors opened again. Yes, and um, I'm very aware that during 2020 we had a similar problem where it, w it was possible, but only because of pumping, to discharge into the River Cam from my area, because the river, of course, you'll know, folks, is higher than the surrounding land. So, do you know if any, any agreement has been made for this storage? Basically, this would be deliberate flooding of land in all, because, because you cannot pump it out at the Webb's Hole Sluice. Do you know if any... Um, discussions have been had about that at all, um, making provision for that on land storage? No, all, all, all it appears that the developers wish to store is, is the normal rates that would happen on the site that wasn't constrained as Swavis it is. Um, and I think that's all they're prepared to store. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr Wilderspin. Thank you very much. We have a question from Councillor Roberts and then Harvey. Thank you, Chairman, and through you, Chairman, to um, our participant. Um, can you tell me, I think you said it was something like nearly 200 houses um, in the village had the potential for flooding. Um, is, is it across the village, or is it in one specific area of the village that you think that that possibility could occur, please? It, it is actually through the middle of the village and it doesn't only affect the 198 properties, it also affects um, an electricity substation, a gas governor and a sewage pumping station which would affect a far bigger area than the 195 houses. Thank you. And Councillor Harvey, please. So, just interested to know in terms of a long-term climate change mitigation is it is it feasible to install a pump at the point uh, so that you can clear the water when the sluice is closed um there, there is already a pump at webb's hole sluice but that pump is solely to deal with the sewage discharges from we, we discussed this at the last meeting the problem is if we have further surface water um, entering this system um, while that pump is running, it, it impacts on its ability to pump the foul water flows that it was designed to do. And the only way that you could make it better is to put in a, a massively larger pump than the one that is already there. Thank you for that. And Councillor Richard Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Wildersman. I just want to ask you a, a very quick question. Um, if this application goes ahead um, as planned without any of the mitigations you've talked about, um, could you just give us an indication of um, the likelihood that you think that we're going to see significant problems from certain to very likely to possible? Well, I think it is very likely because of the last, especially because of the last comments that I made that it's going to impact on the, on the effects of the pump that is already designed to pump the water from the, the, the foul water flows. Of course, the foul water flows are complete cl cross catchment flows and are not, the Swavesey system was not designed to take that in the first place anyway. Thank you. Thank you. And another question from Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair, for letting me come back. Um, Mr. Wilders, when you were making your statement, you did mention, I couldn't quite write it quickly enough, um, a potential condition that you thought would be appropriate. Can you remind us what that was? 
in Swavesey, there are two sites that are conditioned to, once the doors at Webb's Hole Sluice are closed, those sites have to store all the water from, from that they generate on their sites um, until such time as the sluice opens. Incidentally, this is also what happens on phase one, two, and three A of North Stoke because they are conditioned that those the system there, if the outfall from those systems is in flood, they cannot discharge. Does that answer your question? Um, no. Do you, do you want to rephrase? Sorry, I don't understand. If it doesn't answer your question, what it is you 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 want to know? Okay. I think there were two things there. You answered a different question. You maybe I misunderstood. I thought you were requiring us to put a condition on this if we were to go ahead with it. Did you, or did I misunderstand that? Yeah, no, I did. I said that was that was a minimum of what we thought would would be required, and that condition is that the three B site should retain all its flows of water until such time as the Webb's Hole sluice opens. Is, okay. is, is, is that what? If that answer, that, I great. Think that's what it was. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bradnam, please. But in addition to that, Mr. Wilderspin, I think I've, I sketched down very quickly. I think you also mentioned the following, and I just wanted to clarify whether you thought these would be useful additional conditions. This was for the telemetry at the Webb's Hole Sluice. You said there was a six site monitoring system, but then later on you said it wasn't there yet. So that's one thing, the telemetry at the Webb's Hole Sluice. You've also mentioned separately, perhaps we need a much bigger pump because you said that the existing pump is simply to deal with the foul water, uh, sorry, the sewage outflow. And, uh, and then you went on to the fact that the developer had promised that they wouldn't submit their application until that was agreed. So do we also need a condition dealing with telemetry at and thirdly, a very much bigger pump. What happened, the two sites in Swavesey Village were conditioned, um, as, as I've described. And unfortunately, one of those developers went ahead with developing their site without consulting the Environment Agency on, on how this, the telemetry from their site would work. And we now find ourselves in a situation where there is a hold-up on the telemetry for the one of those sites. Um, so therefore, no, the telemetry isn't in, site, in place at the moment, but it is supposed to be being put in place. There are legal agreements going forward at the moment, I think. Obviously, two of those sites have been taken by the two sites in Swavesey so that their telemetry can link up with the EA's telemetry, that leaves four more sites. So perhaps what we need to consider is a condition to ensure that the telemetry is in place before this development goes ahead. Um, yes, <laughs> is the short answer to that. But I mean, there was a condition there before on, yes. on the other site and they just didn't. So that the, condition that's, the conditions that are already in place are enacted before this, this development goes ahead? Yeah. Yeah, okay. And um, what about the very big pump idea? My concern at the moment is that, as, as I mentioned, cumulative effects is a big concern to us. Um, at the moment, the IDB on pre-planning applications is talking about a further... 50 hectares of industrial site. The parish council have talked about another site, which is another 20 hectares of industrial site. So you can see where I'm going. We, we, we have the plan for the next Greater Cambridge plan, whatever it's called, 
which is probably going to put the, most of their development in the North Stowe area. Um, the surface water from that could possibly, although not coming down into the Swavesy system, could come down the other side of the Swavesy system in what we call the Coval's drain, and the foul sewerage could come through to Swave, through to Uttons Drove and Swavesy yes. as well. So cumulative effects are going to probably destroy everything we might do now. So in the future, I don't know what the answer is. So, so if I may, Chair, I'll, yes, I'll stop quickly. after this. Yep. So. The rain is the same, on, and so the incident rain from rainfall and surface water is the same whether it's developed or not. It just depends the speed with which the water goes into the drain is affected by the development. But what development brings onto the site is um, sewage requirements. You know, so so that will put more pressure on the Uttons Drove um, system, won't it? So, so you're looking to the future about this larger pump. Sewage flows will, will, will put more pressure on, obviously, but also surface water puts more pressure on. If, if, I, um, if I had a plant pot here, a big plant pot, and I get a glass of water and I pour it in that big plant pot, you won't see any effect on this table. If I get that same glass of water and pour it on this table, that water is going to run straight off the table. That is the difference with how water flow comes into an area. So it's we're talking about the speed um, of dis yes. discharge into the drain yeah. relative to ground falling on the ground. Okay, thank okay. you, Chair. That's fine, thank you. Um, okay, I think that's all the questions of clarification for, uh, for Mr. Wilderspin. So we say thank you again for your time and answering all the questions. And with that, we'll move to our next public speaker who's joining us online, Mr. Daniel Fulton. Are you with us, Mr. Fulton? Uh, yes, Chair, thank you. Good morning. Um, I believe you're pretty familiar with the, the process of public speaking. Three yes. minutes to address the committee, and at the end of which there may be some questions of clarification for yourself. So if you'd stay on the line, that'd be helpful. Okay, thank you. So um, I've been working on these two North Road planning applications for the past month. The local planning authority has created a lot of problems for itself with the poor quality of its officers' report, which are completely full of uh, contradictions. Um, just looking at one, Paragraph 452 says that the impacts on the local rivers uh, terrace deposit are not assessed because they're a, a are assessed as not significant and are not within the not within the environmental impact assessment. Um, so it's obviously been recognized that the impacts on groundwater, both locally at the river terrace deposit and in terms of drinking water abstraction in the Cam Chalk Aquifer are material planning considerations. The amount of time that this committee has spent debating them at the last meeting is indicative of just how important the primacy of these planning considerations is. And yet for key material planning considerations to be assessed as not significant in the scope of the 2017 environmental impact assessment regulations simply just is not, it doesn't make any sense. How can something that is a material planning consideration and an environmental impact not be significant enough to require assessment under the EIA regulations? Um, that's the first point. Um, the second is that friends of the CAM uh, have written to Mr. Kelly several times now asking him to clarify a number of factual statements he said about the CAM Chalk Aquifer at the last meeting. No response has been received. Um, there was a time when this council would engage with groups and try to correct records and try to correct matters that have been mistaken on the records um, and try to do the best it could to put factual information before the committee. Um, the the council is no longer doing that. And I don't know if that's because of staffing problems or exactly what the political dynamics are, but there are a lot of problems here. The, uh, the last thing I'll just add is I'm extremely concerned by the inadequacy of the um, assessment for, provided by the Environment Agency. The Environment Agency was has apparently not considered the H.R. Wallingford reports um, as part of its uh, review of the environmental impact assessment because they were not provided to the Environment Agency as part of the environmental impact assessment process. Whether or not the environmental impact assessment is adequate is first in the first instance, a matter for the planning judgment of the local planning authority. 
that is the 11 members of the committee. Um, and I think, I think um, the facts are pretty clear on this. I'm also extremely concerned at the amount of influence that Homes England has with the Environment Agency. It pains me to say this, but I just, the Environment Agency seems to be ignoring all of the environmental information that is inconvenient for Homes England. And this is something that will obviously have to be addressed um, at the national government level, but I'm just very concerned. Uh, thank you for, for listening uh, to me today. Thank you very much, Mr. Fulton. Um, members, do you have any questions of clarification for Mr. Fulton? No, I don't see any. So, yeah, just leaves me to say thank you very much for your comments this morning. And we'll move to our next public speaker, who again is joining us virtually, Mr. Bruce Robjants. Mr. Robjants, are you with us? Uh, hopefully. Yeah, we, we can hear you, we can't see you. Um. If you can't get the camera to work, it's not a huge issue as long as we can hear you. Yeah, there we go. We've got you. Okay. Great. Um, so, as with the other public speakers, three minutes to make your case to the uh, committee, and then at the end of which, if you'd like to stay on the line in case there's any questions or clarification for yourself. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, I'm Bruce Rob James from. Sorry, Mr. Robjan, as, as you were. Um, I'm a Willingham resident, um, and the first thing I wanted to talk about was shops, or the lack of them. Uh, all of the phases are, are, uh, show shops on their details, um, but with more than a thousand residents uh, in the first phases, they still haven't got a shop. If, uh, if they need a pint of milk, they've got to get in the car. Um, we shouldn't be allowing any more houses without a, at least a few shops. Um, you can prevail on the developers to, to do something about that. Um, secondly is GP provision. Um, all of the residents at present have to use the surgery at Long Stanton. Um, and this hasn't got any GPs either. Those GPs come from Willingham. Um, we shouldn't be having any more houses without GPs on site. Uh, I, I listened to the presentation for phase 3A and like a lot of other residents was horrified at what I heard especially when you wave that application through. Um, I've heard nothing about sustainable drainage. Um, you've allowed the uh, developers to concrete over um, half of Cambridgeshire um, when uh, this isn't uh, necessary. Um, you could be using permeable paving in lots of these areas. Uh, and then you wouldn't be putting this, so much water into drains. Um, you could be having rainwater harvesting uh, and there could be uh, solar panels on every house if you ask for it, but they're just being allowed to do as they like. Uh, that's uh, mainly what I wanted to say, thank you. Hey, thank you very much for that. Um, there may be some questions of clarification for you, members. Do we have any? Councillor Hawkins? Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for um, um, your presentation. I just wanted to check with you, really. You, you are aware that this is not the permanent, um, sort of, put it this way. This is uh, planning permission for the development to go ahead as a whole, but the details um, will be with the reserve matters application later on. So issues like permeable paving, uh, rainwater harvesting, solar panels, these are details that will come later on with the further planning permission for reserve matters. Are you aware of that? I, I am, 
but I'm just looking to what you've already allowed to be built. Um, and these things are not happening. It didn't happen on the on phase one. Um, it didn't happen uh, uh, on any of the bits that are, are where people have now moved into. Um, so um, are we going to make the same mistakes again? Okay, I hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Brandon. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. It, if I hope I've got your name right. Um, I wondered whether you'd seen um, paragraph 164 of the planning application, which does reflect, reflect um, a requirement, a future requirement for permeable paving. In fact, it refers to it the other way around. It says um, that the site is split into two catchments, which both drain northwards to the Swavesey drain, and impermeable areas across the site will be limited to 62% for residential parcels. So that leaves 38% will be permeable. Then it says it will be limited to 40% for schools. So that would leave 60 as being permeable. And then it will be limited to 100% for primary and secondary streets. So none of those would be permeable. So there is provision for permeable paving. And I, like you, am very keen that we should put as much permeable paving in as possible. But I just wondered if that reassures you at all. Well, uh, I'm afraid you know, what, what's happened already doesn't give me any reassurance at all um, that the bits that are permeable are things like playing fields. Um, the the uh, roads and the parking areas are not permeable um, and they could be. I know it's more expensive, but developers don't want to do it. Uh, so, and you have the opportunity to make them do it. And thank you. That, that you're, you're making a point that I was going to make in debate. So thank you very much. No. Uh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Rebjorn. I think those are all the questions for yourself. So thank you very much for your time this morning and for giving us your thoughts. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. Okay. okay. We'll move on to the next section of our public speakers, which are, which is the applicant. So I'm hoping we have joining us online, Mr. Michael Bottomley, who is the agent. Hello, good morning. Hi, good morning, Mr. Bottomley. Um, and I believe you're also joined by your drainage consultant from Arcadis, is that right? Yes, that's correct. I'm going to uh, introduce the majority of our statement and then pass over to uh, Maddie uh, at the end to introduce herself and answer any questions about drainage. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. So, the, uh, the usual three minutes, and then there'll probably be some questions for you at the end of that. So, if you could both stay on the line, that would be helpful. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. So thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Michael Bottomley and I'm a planning consultant for Tibbalds uh, representing Homes England. Homes England are a non-departmental public body sponsored by the Department of Leveling Up, Housing and Communities. Homes England's role is to accelerate the delivery of housing across England to provide more people, uh, to ensure more people have better access to homes in the right places. This means that as a public sector master developer, Homes England are seeking to deliver North Stowe in the public interest. Phase 3B is a fully allocated housing site and will deliver the final 1,000 homes within the new town. The preparation of the outline planning application and the principles of development include a focus on delivering a healthy and sustainable community with affordable housing and open space. Phase 3B is located to the north of the B1050 with the settlement edge of Longstanton adjoining the southern edge of the carriageway. A defined building edge will be introduced along the B1050 to create an outward looking and distinctive entrance to Northstow whilst at the same time incorporating setback elements and appropriate green space and landscaping. Primary access to the site will be via an improved roundabout. And the master plan process um, proposes a, net a network of pedestrian and cycle paths to provide direct and legible routes across the site and into phase one. Biodiversity net gain will exceed policy requirements and green space will occupy a third of the site, as well as protecting existing trees and hedgerows. Phase 3B has rigorously followed the environmental impact assessment process with the scope agreed with the district council and county councils and other statutory consultees to ensure that the likely effects of the proposed development on the environment are understood and taken into account. The drainage strategy for the site will result in inherent betterment, 
Attenuation provided on site will minimise runoff to the mean and annual greenfield runoff rates for up to and including a one in 200 year rainfall event plus 40% climate change in line with best practice. Over and above this, the proposals allow for additional storage to include contingency for higher rainfall events. In terms of potential groundwater connectivity within the eastern third of the site only, management strategies are proposed such as discharging groundwater locally following any uh, licensed dewatering. It is unlikely that the development of phase 3b will affect groundwater levels on the adjoining land. Foul drainage arrangements have been agreed with Anglian Water and water supply has been secured for the whole of North Stone. The technical team who worked on the proposals are on hand to answer your questions, including Janice Hughes, who's the project director for technical, environmental and transport matters, Dean Harris, who's the planning manager for Homes England, Philip Harker, who's the infrastructure lead at Homes England, Katia Silla, who's the urban designer and master planner, and I'd also like to introduce the drainage expert, Madeline Davies. Hi all, uh, Maddie Davis from Arcadis on behalf of Homes England. So I'll be on hand today to deal with all the queries you've got in relation to drainage and groundwater. Thank you. That's great, thank you very much for that. Um, okay, members, so any questions or clarification for the applicant or their drainage consultant who's on hand? Councillor Roberts, then Williams. Thank you, Chairman, and through you, Chairman. Um, good morning. Um, in the public interest, interesting statement, really. Um, is it really in the public interest? H have you listened, and I'm sure you have this morning, to the concerns of uh, the experts, the local experts, internal drainage board, uh, regarding uh, the possibility of major flooding in Swavesy itself. Um, <clears throat> these people are not amateurs. They have intense and personal knowledge of the land situation around Swavesy over Willingham, uh, which is a very special um, situation. Um, can you tell me how much concern have you got with the information that was relayed to us by the internal drainage board. Sure. I'm not sure who wants to take that, but if any of you want to comment. Shall I take that one, Mike? No. Hi, Dean. You're on mute, Dean. You're muted, Mr. Harris. Apologies, uh, Dean Harris from Homes England. Uh, just on hand to answer questions and direct them to our consultant team. I was going to ask Maddie to answer that question, please. Yeah, that's fine. We've um, liaised with the IDB previously and we are aware of the concerns with flood risk to Swavesy. Uh, on that basis, we've developed a drainage strategy that accords with the requirements of the MPPA. It's in line with best practice, as agreed, I think you've previously said, with both the LLFA and the EA. The discussions we've had with the IDB previously are that they would like water to be discharged out of their wider catchment at a faster rate than the mean annual greenfield runoff rate, which is best practice and limiting it, limiting runoff to be in line with the current greenfield runoff rates. That is something that we've said we can look to explore further and has been conditioned so we can see what the impacts of letting water off the site at a quicker rate could be downstream. And that's something that will work with them um, through the conditions of the site to try and achieve. If letting the water out at a higher rate increases the flood risks downstream in Swavesy, that's obviously a concern, which is why we have the current strategy of mimicking existing greenfield runoff rates. Okay, I think Councillor Roberts wanted to come back. Um, I think I've done a lot. Of <coughs> back on. Yeah, you, you said that you've previously um, had discussions um, with the Internal Drainage Board, but to my recollection, the Internal da Drainage Board, one of the things that it was very concerned about was the um, fact that they haven't of late um, had any um, meetings at all, by the sounds of it, never mind meetings of any importance. 
Now, this is a really serious uh, worry, I'm sure, to myself and lots of my colleagues um, who know Swayze and that area very well. And um, it seems to me, why are you jumping ahead of the gun? I mean, this has got to be talked about very uh, seriously and uh, in some depth. And I would have suggested before you put in this application and started running the hair, that you should have actually uh, had much more debate with the internal debt donage board. Why are you putting this forward now when there is obviously such uh, concern from experts about the impact. It, it seems to me that you're just totally ignoring it. You're talking about, you know, oh, best, best, best means, etc. But, you know, in reality, are you not just sort of barging this through? So a question around consultation there, I think. I'm not sure who'd like to answer that. Um, yes, me, Chair. The application has been under consideration for um almost two years now and the master plan has been uh, in preparation for over four years so there has been considerable um dialogue um tens of meetings with all the different um stakeholders and so um there is a housing crisis which we are working to resolve but we appreciate that development needs to be um sustainable the impact on adjoining communities needs to be considered hence that level of engagement and collaboration which has been undertaken over the, the last few years and will continue to be undertaken as detailed proposals are um, put together, uh, assuming planning permission is, of uh, course, granted. Okay. Thank so you. building houses is more important than um, houses and people who already let, live there being flooded. Okay. I don't think you need to come back on that. Thank you. Councillor Richard Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got uh, three points, really. Um, just following on about the Internal Drainage Board, um, it, uh, reference was made earlier to an undertaking that had been given that plans wouldn't be brought forward until there was an agreement with the IDB. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on why that didn't happen. Um, secondly, one of the things that's been suggested, picked up by a few other members, is that uh, it might, at least in part, be possible to address this through a condition uh, requiring um, the water to be kept on this site at the points where it can't be discharged. I'd welcome your reaction to that and whether you'd be comfortable with such a condition. And then thirdly, to pick up the point I was talking about earlier with the um, river terrace deposits and the aquifer. Now, the eastern 40% or so of this site is on a secondary aquifer. The middle part, or most of the western part, is on this Amp Hill clay, which seems to be unproductive. Now, I have looked at the Arcadis report, or the note, from January, um, and it talks, as Mr. Kelly referenced earlier, about um, the water level being four to five metres lower. But can I get a bit of clarity as to where on the site that those readings come from? Because from reading your report and the different uh, makeup and structure of the clay to the aquifer, I would imagine that there would be different readings in different parts of the site if I read your report correctly. Um, so I'd value a bit of clarity um, on that. And maybe as well on, on, on the, the question I, I asked earlier as to whether it, it, it's, it, th there is going to be any, what, what the cumulative impact would be on the um, water levels here, particularly on that eastern side, where, where, where it's above the aquifer. Okay, Thanks. So I think three questions there. Um, again, I'll leave it up to you three to decide who's going to answer which. Uh, thanks, Chair. They all sound quite technical to me. I'm going to leave that to the expert, Maddie Davies, if that's OK. Yeah, that's fine. OK, so to answer the question about any change in groundwater levels, so that, we've said the aquifer affects only a small portion of the site. Um, and I don't know if it'd be helpful if I show a plan of the site uh, and I can point at that. Yes, I think that'd be helpful if you could. Okay. So hopefully let me know when you can see that. We can see it. So this is the illustrative master plan for the site. 
and the aquifer that everyone's been talking about affects sort of broadly this area of the site uh, and runs sort of in a northwards direction. So that area that's the based on the sort of sands and gravels and there's limited connectivity in those sands and gravels for water flow through that area. Now we have said that there's a, a range of depths of groundwater within the site that is because this end of the site is actually higher than this end of than the western end of the site, which is predominantly um, green and open space. At this end of the site, levels are at about, I think, five metres AOD, whereas where we've got the school and the site access, we're up at about nine metres AOD, so a significant level drop across the site. The aquifer in this area is actually quite deep, and when we did our initial investigations on site, at this end, groundwater levels were probably about five metres deep. Um, the, this two thirds of the site, the western two thirds, that's predominantly clay, and therefore you don't get the same movement of water through that media as you might do through the lenses of sands and gravels that affect this end of the site. So what we have said is, as a result of developments, um, that in line with the requirements of EA licensing. If for whatever reason any excavations are significantly deep and may impact on groundwater levels in that area, any groundwater that has to be extracted is put back into the ground within the site itself. Therefore, it will not make any fundamental difference to groundwater levels upstream or downstream because it will be put back into the site in the same area. Once the site's developed and we have a positive drainage system in that area, we have said that we will look to recharge groundwater and have sustainable drainage systems like permeable paving that can look to put water back into the ground in this area, uh, if that's feasible as part of the detailed design. Did that answer all three questions? Uh, I don't think so. I think I think it certainly answered one of them. The other two were around whether you'd be open to accepting a condition around holding the water on site. And then the, the, the first question, as I understood it, was around, again, around consultation with the IDB and the understanding that the IDB should be in support of this before it came forward before us. But those were the yeah. other two. OK, so we did have discussions with the IDB, EA and LLFA at the beginning of this process and agreed an approach to drainage at that time. The IDB were keen that we discharged surface water runoff from this site at a higher rate than the existing greenfield runoff rate. That would only be feasible if the downstream network off-site which is not the responsibility of Homes England, was capable of taking that increased flow if it has that capacity. Some a methodology for understanding the capacity of that downstream network was agreed by all parties, and an initial assessment has been undertaken as to what that increased rate could potentially be. Uh, and that has been submitted as part of the uh, planning documents and the FRA. Further discussions have had been had with the IDB since that date, but as we were unable to come to an agreement on what the increased rate of discharge would need to be, it was agreed that at this with it was agreed with the LLFA and the EA that working in line with national planning policy guidance and best practice was the preferred approach, limiting runoff to three litres a second a hectare, uh, which is the mean annual greenfield runoff rate for all events up to and including the one in 200 year event. Now the 200 year event is over and above current best practice. Um, current best practice is only the 100 year event and we should note that we've made an additional allowance for storing additional runoff due to climate change. That's an additional 40 percent. 
we have also made an allowance for events over and above of that. So we have some additional free board built into the design. We think that gives us the flexibility to be able to store water for the extreme events that we've been talking about, that people are concerned about, and provides a solution that is over and above current best practice, but whilst also enabling us to work with the IDB going forward to see if their desire for an increased runoff rate, i.e. storing less water on site, is potentially achievable as part of the detailed design. So just to note that affects downstream assets that are not the responsibility of Homes England. Can I, um, through you, Chair, thank you. Um, can I just ask you to clarify a point? Because I think in the debate and reflecting on Councillor Williams's question, I, we perhaps haven't explained this. There is already, and on that illustrative plan that you can see, there are two large on-site storage ponds for surface water, uh, which I think equate to something around 20,000 cubic metres of storage on this scheme. Can, can, you, can you clarify that for the committee? Because I think in the flood risk assessment, the provision there is a design solution for on-site holding water. Uh, and the flood risk assessment, I think, notes that in consultation with the IDB, that scheme and the management of the discharge from that scheme either allows for greenfield runoff rates, which in many respects are existing rates of discharge, therefore should have no impact on the uh, IDB's uh, concerns, or on a faster rate of release based upon the storage capacity that um, uh, is available, or indeed the whole, uh, and, and I wonder if you can just clarify that point, because I think there might have been some misunderstanding, and I recognise that as officers we didn't explain that there are two very large attenuation ponds on the site. So I wonder if you can just help the committee I, with that. Yes, I can clarify. So to confirm, the drainage strategy includes these areas that you can see here, which are strategic attenuation basins and will hold water back and let it out at that low mean annual greenfield runoff rate. On top of that, before water gets to these features, each development parcel will include sustainable drainage systems, which will further look to mimic existing greenfield runoff rates uh, and slow water down. That could be the permeable paving that was talked about previously, could be swales. Water will then slowly percolate through to these strategic basins, and that's where they will be held and let out at that low rate. So at the moment, if you had a 100-year rainfall event, you'd probably be getting about 11 litres a second for every hectare of site running off the site and downstream into the Swavesy drain. We would be holding that back and letting it out at a slower rate, three litres a second a hectare, even in that extreme 100-year rainfall event. That allows for climate change as well an additional 40%. And as I said, we've also sized it, not just for the 100 year event, but for the 200 year event as well. Okay, Councillor Williams, does that answer your questions? So, sort of, Chair, just, just a couple of quick clarification points. Um, just, just one, um, and I do mean this neutrally, the IDB doesn't feel it's been consulted since, since 2019. So I was wondering if you could just clarify as to why you're saying you've consulted them, but the IDB is saying they haven't been consulted. Um, how can that be? Um, just on that point about those um, attenuation ponds, obviously that's not foul water, that's just surface water. Um, so yeah, that, 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 that obviously, um, that, that, that's correct on that one. Thank you. So really, it, it's the first point about the consultation. I don't know who'd like to take that. Dean, are you happy for me to answer that? Yes, please, Mary. Yeah. Uh, so we have had a number of meetings with the IDB. I think the crux of the matter is that the rate for discharge, the higher rate for discharge, um, wasn't agreed prior, prior to planning um, because that's a 
requires a lot of modeling of the downstream network and the rate was not we were not able to confirm that the downstream network would take that higher rate of discharge. Uh, we have been speaking to the IDB about the wider North Stow development as well, including the other phases. So we have had a number of meetings. Um, I'll allow Keith to come back on this, but I, I think their concern is that we have not formally agreed this higher discharge rate that they are keen to have but it is conditioned. OK, thank you for that. Um, Councillor Bradnam, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so I have three questions. Um, I'll just say them quickly first so that you can make a note. Why isn't there more permeable paving? Um, number two is what happens to Swave C? You say you've made provision and you will monitor it. now. The problem is, if the provision you've made is not adequate, what actually happens at Swavesy is that those 195 properties look as if they might get flooded. And that's, one would hope we would do something before that happens. And thirdly, where is, is this, are these two attenuation ponds you're referring to, are these the storage that is being envisaged? Or are we talking about additional storage? And I might come back with more detail. Um, coming back to the first one, the pre permeable paving, uh, Mr. Rodent um, made the point, and he's quite right. I quoted some figures for um, impermeable areas will be limited to and various percentages. And he quite rightly made the point that that is simply because they're not, you're not making any provision for permeable paving on roads or pavements, and that would seem to be perfectly sensible. The 40%, he alluded to the fact that's simply because you're allowing the 60% to be the playing field. And for six, the 62% for residential parcels, he made the point that the remainder of the 38% is, of course, the gardens. But actually, we ought to be making permeable paving the rule throughout a development. And I say this with experience because there are two developments in Water Beach, one of which has permeable paving throughout the other which doesn't. The one with permeable paving never has a problem with water and there never appears to be a problem with water on it. And I'd asked the lead local flood authority, why is it that these two properties are very, these two developments are very different? And she said, well, that because that one has permeable paving. The other one, every time it rains heavily, it has two, th three enormous balancing ponds. And when it rains very heavily, these fill like huge lagoons right to the top and every parent who has a child you know no, I, think, I think the question has been asked so, Let, let's see what so they have to say can we just um think about more permeable paving what happens to swavesy and where's the storage okay thank you uh who would like to attack those three please chair if i can just say a few words on permeable paving <laughs> happy to um, <clears throat> accept an extension of the design code condition on this. Uh, absolutely happy to aim for um, best practice. Subject to a couple of limitations, I think um, the county will have a view on whether it's um, appropriate for adopted streets and we have to obviously comply with those requirements and also um, uh, our technical experts would have a view on whether it's appropriate across the whole site as it were but certainly happy to be um, aiming for best practice on um, permeable um, pavements and surfacing within private parking areas and things like that. So, Chair, would it be possible to make a condition on that? Sorry, just... When we get to the debate. Okay, um, so... Maddy, you read my mind, I was going to pass the tricky questions over to you, if that's okay. That's all right. Well, just building on what Dean said there, um, the... Flood risk assessment and drainage strategy does make reference to the incorporation of sustainable drainage features within all parcels, including permeable paving. So that is very much a system that is being going, uh, promoted as part of the development and will slow water down. So these strategic basins are simply the last part of the drainage strategy. Uh, for treating water on site. So it's not the only feature 
it's just the last part. So permeable paving certainly will be considered as part of the wider development. In terms of water downstream and how that will affect Swavesy, as we've mentioned a number of times, if we're limiting the discharge from the site to the existing mean annual greenfield runoff rates, that's the rate of runoff you currently get from this site. So we're mitigating that runoff as best as we can within the area that we have control over. Uh, does um, that answer your questions, Councillor? So and um, the storage is that ah, yes. Is it? Storage. So the storage within the basins, they have been sized to take the 200 year uh, runoff from the site. Going back to your points about areas of permeability and impermeability, areas with it, which are permeable, greenfield, will run off as they naturally do. Those basins have been sized to take all of the runoff from the impermeable areas. So any additional permeable paving would be over and above that, and that will store that water for the 200 year event with an allowance for an additional 40% due to climate change. And we've built in some residual capacity over and above that. It will then let the water out at a slow rate, the existing mean annual greenfield runoff rate of three litres a second per hectare for those areas. So yes, those basins do provide the storage. If the IDB wanted more storage over and above that rate that would need to be in addition to what's shown here. Okay. Thank you members. I've got one, two, three, four more public speakers. Then I'm going to have a break up at that point and then we'll come back uh, with our parish councils who have some comments. Five public speakers. So next we have Councillor Hales. Thank you. Um, Quite a few of my questions have been answered, and they were going to be mainly around the um, one in 200 year calculations. And uh, I think Maddie has said that the 200 year is more stringent, if you like, than the 100 year. I'll take a word for it. I don't understand the calculation behind it, but uh, if you get a moment or a week to explain it, then that would be nice. Um, what I will say, actually, is um, Mr. Rogers, one of our previous speakers, made reference to the developments that have happened already and houses now occupied and what have you and the lack of community provision shops etc and I, I don't suppose it was a, a throwaway comment by mr rogers but actually it's a pretty worthwhile one if it was i would like to take it up with the developers and that is the provision of pv on the roof so of all housing not just affordable so that would be my question to the developers through you, Chair. Thank you. So, again, not sure who wants to take that one up around provision of PV. Chair, um, renewable um, energy provision is part of the um, proposal, so there will be um, PVs uh, across um, the roofs regardless of tenure as such so i believe that's um accommodated within the um, proposals and the um, suggested conditions okay thank you for that okay what percentage uh, uh dean please um that's a good question i was going to um suggest i direct it to my colleague um janice hughes in terms of the percentage i think the percentage is more aimed at um, percentage of the energy requirement rather than the percentage of roofs as such. Is that right, Janice? Yes, I think we've presented an energy strategy which seeks to achieve um, better um, a, a sort of target of 19% of um, energy efficiency beyond the building regulations with potential for it to be considerably more. And that's based on a mix of solar PVs as well as air source ground heating. So that will be dealt with with an energy strategy for each parcel of land in order to achieve those targets. And um, that needs to be dependent on the type of homes and the mix. But the aim is that the strategy is 
all electric provision and solar PVs and air source ground heating on all properties as appropriate. So I think it's hard to put an actual percentage on roof space or, or numbers of units, but it will be seeking to achieve that high target of um, energy um, efficiency above building regs. Ma'am, thank you. Um, I take your point with regards to the, if you like, the building requirements, you know, the, the legislation, so to speak, but I was just wondering whether or not this would be an opportunity for you to, given the, the current uh, cost of energy with the expected increases that we discussed this, I think, last time we were here, in my head, um, I just wonder whether there's, there's any merit in, in making this as, as much of a 100% coverage of roof space so that it doesn't really matter whether it's an affordable mid-range, top-end, whichever you like, home, that they have the provision not to take from the grid and provide battery storage within as well. But the other part of my question, Chair, through you, was about the provision. This was what Mr Rogers was saying, is that there are large numbers of people that have to get in a car for a pint of milk, and the shops have not either been encouraged or even brought forward within the established areas that have already been occupied. So my question would be, what are you going to do as the developer to make that provision up front so that the existing population can access areas as well as the, the uh, next to be built? A chair, through, through you, I think that's kind of to be picked up as part of the other phases, the preceding phases of um, North so the district council has a role now in delivering the phase one local centre and there are exciting proposals for that and we have our own town centre strategy where we're currently seeking a partner to deliver the first uh, phase of the town centre um, with proposals including a local convenience store and a market hall so so these things are um, coming and in the meantime there are these kind of meanwhile uses the North Stowe foodies that we know about etc that are uh, very successful uh, and working well. So um, I don't know that that's necessarily a, um, a for phase 3B to resolve. Um, by the time 3B is developed, I'm hoping there will be some great facilities at Northstow. OK, thank you for that response. Uh, we'll move on now to Councillor Ripper. Please. I just want a yes or no answer to this question. Um, have you or have you not had a meeting with the Swayze IDB since February 2019? I imagine that's for Maddie. Yes, we have had meetings with IDB since 2019. They weren't solely related to the discussion of 3B, but they did cover 3B. Okay, so... Um, I'm going to have to sort of take it. One person says one thing, another says another. Um, I just want really a comment, if I may, Chair, that since there's been quite sort of, how can I put it, drastic flooding in Christmas 2020 in the district as a whole, and I imagine quite close from what's been said to Swayze, I just think it would have been that's a good idea, um, because obviously the situation is ever changing and has potentially changed since that last major meeting, which everybody agrees on, did happen. Yeah, I don't think any need to come back on that. Thank you. Councillor Calm, please. Question of clarity. Um, again, coming back to the issue of, of sea level rise over the period of time um, and the fact that it was commented that even now, sometimes they can't discharge into the river for four weeks at a time. Um, so uh, while the, uh, I'm, I'm glad to see there's a large area of storage on site, um, I, I just wondered that um, if the sea level rise is as drastic as is often predicted to be in the, over the, next, the lifetime of the housing that will be developed, we could see much longer periods when uh, it's impossible to discharge because the sea level, if you raise it, the level of at the sea, uh, the bottom of the river, it will back up the river and cause problems. 
Um, the extent of that is not predictable, part because it also depends upon development in the whole of the catchment of the river uh, and upstream. It may be that actually even beanfield rate discharge is a problem, and you might be wishing to close off all discharge and store. So I'd be interested to know how much period of time you could actually just not discharge at all within the storage that you've got, and what if in the future it was necessary, would you be able to increase the capacity of your storage ponds um, so that you could do it perhaps for a longer period? Thank you. I think that was pretty directed at yourself, Maddie. Apologies for that. Uh, so the two parts there about the sea level rises, as we've said, we've allowed for climate change, 40%. That is at the upper end um, of the currently uh, understood significant impacts of surface water runoff as set out by the EA. They have a range 20 to 40 percent. So we've allowed for 40 percent that is in line with best practice. Uh, the second part of the question about how long could we discharge no water from the site? That is not something that we've assessed as part of this application, so I'm not able to comment on that point. Okay. Thank you. Did you want to come back, Councillor? Is that okay? okay. No, I, I, I can understand that it's not actually something one could require, it's just that it is, was a point of interest, and I just wonder what the flexibility there was in the site, and, and particularly whether you could increase the capacity work to be necessary. Whether it could be increased at a future date if it was considered to be a beneficial. Okay. Within the space available, um, there is some flexibility. This is an outline application. We've tried to make a conservative assessment of space required for that attenuation. And as we said, we've sized it for the 200 year event. So it is more conservative than you would have on other developments that are simply limiting to the 100 year event. OK, members, we're going to pause for a second while we um, one of our members has had to excuse himself for a minute. So if we give him give him a minute to come back and then we'll we've got said we've got two more uh, questions from members and then we'll have a proper break. OK, um, Maddie, our, our members now returned. I don't know if it'd be possible to very briefly repeat that last point, just so you know, all members have had all the information at the same time. I don't know if that's possible. Yes, that's fine. Uh, so the two points that or two queries that were made, uh, one is about the um, sea level rise and effect of climate change. As I said, we have allowed for an additional 40% uh, storage due to climate change, and that is at the upper end of the EA's scale um, of how climate change will increase runoff from developments. So that's uh, in line with best practice. The second point was, can we, or for how long, can we hold back water on site without discharging any runoff whatsoever? As I said, that's not something we've assessed as part of this application, so I'm unable to confirm that point. But what I can confirm is that we have uh, sized that space to allow for the 200 year rainfall events, including the 40 percent for climate change. That is over and above what other developments um, would allow for. They would only allow for the 100 year event. And we have out, we have designed it conservatively to take the runoff from all impermeable areas on site. So if we do include permeable paving and suds that allow groundwater recharge, they'll limit runoff that will go downstream and therefore there'll be extra capacity in the space that we've made available. Thank you for coming, that again, I appreciate it. Uh, question of from Councillor Heather William, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, and maybe to everybody's surprise, not a question on drainage, I'm afraid, Chair. Um, <laughs> 
So um, I just I'm looking at this the Google Earth imagery of of um, the area, <clears throat> and on page 161, the map which does show you about the heights. Now, in the past, it's been important, and also many would say necessary to give that degree of separation to Long Stanton, sort of a a divide of green space or, or something or other. And obviously in this area, we are very, very, very close to Long Stanton itself. I'm, I'm just wondering, is there any reason other than commercial, because obviously we don't take that into consideration, why there is necessity to have the ability to go up to three storeys um, and therefore increasing the impact on the existing residents of Long Stanton um, for vast areas of the site um, with the exception of a little bit of protection for the North Stow residents themselves already near the station road. Um, so just wondering what the logic is there, Chair, uh, Chair, if there's something that I'm missing, if there's a, a need to have such high buildings in that vicinity so close to that um, to the board of Long Stanton. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. So I think a question around justification of the building heights, please. Uh, Chair, we're applying for up to three storeys and within the area there will be a range of building heights between one and three uh, storeys. There are uh, large um, verges on both sides of the, um, the B1050 um, and the um, framework for North Doe requires kind of confident edges and hence the, the proposal to allow for buildings in places up to three storeys to um, create that kind of legibility and um, uh, announce the development, um, if you like. Um, I was going to bring in um, a colleague from Tibbles, a catcher stiller, uh, an urban designer, to elaborate on my answer, if you think that's appropriate. Yeah, if it's helpful, certainly. Hello everyone, I'm Katja Still from Tibbetts and thank you Dean. Um, as Dean said, there will be a requirement for design code which will set more detailed design guidance for that edge. And at the moment we are applying for story heights up to uh, three stories, um, which would be up to um, kind of 11 point meters, around 11 point meters in height. Um, the distance between our red line, our boundary of the site, and the buildings on Long Stanton are around 77 metres. And we have allowed for a area between the existing road and our first houses of around 29 to 30 metres, as set out on the parameter plans and in the design principles documents. So we expect to enhance the landscape structure along that edge and um, create also a kind of five meter, minimum of five meter open space on that edge. And then there will be a variety of building heights that as Dean said, kind of will create some kind of entrance and announce this new town while also respecting the differences and the buffer and the distances to the existing developments. Um, the strategy of creating confident edges was set out within the very early planning strategies and design strategies for this new town, and we are complying with that. So I hope that answers your question at this point. Okay, thank you. And um, finally, Councillor Hawkins, please. Um, thank you, Chair, and through you, three things I'd like to um, highlight. Um, on page... 89, you talk about gaps. Um, the last sentence in that paragraph, 525, says, for phase 3B, however, it is intended that all dwellings will have electric heating. But then at the same time, you are extending the gas pipeline to phase 3B. What's the point? Because it seems to me, yeah, we will end up putting in gas when you know that from 2025, gas heating is not going to be allowed in the country. So that's the first question. Uh, the second one um, is to do with um, 
construction vehicles going through Willingham. I know that when I had a meeting, I think it was a year and a half, two years ago now, about the problems we were having with construction vehicles, you were not part of it because um, you weren't part of phase one. However, we know that there's still problems. So will you be making sure that your construction vehicles uh, coming to your site don't go through Willingham? And third thing is, I think it was Maddie who said, um, the IDB condition uh, to keep water on the site will be an additional requirement to what is provided now. So my question is, are you prepared to create that additional space? Thank you, Chair. Okay, Dean, three questions for you there. One around, is the gas line necessary? One around the movement of construction vehicles and the third one, again, around the condition around on-site water. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> the gas requirement, I think, is just a preference in relation to cooking. Um, some people prefer to uh, use gas to cook. It will be a low um, requirement, um, but certainly not related to um, heating. Um, happy to accept lorry routing obligation in the proposed section 106. This was discussed at length um, in relation to 3A and I can understand um, it would be a concern in relation to 3B, so happy to accept that um, obligation. In relation to additional um, water storage on site, I think the issue is to do with kind of practicality um, and the impact it would have on the master plan, the ability to deliver uh, the homes on the site, as it were. I will obviously pass over to um, to Maddie to to give you kind of chapter and verse on the practicality of um, achieving additional um, storage, as kind of suggested by the um, IDB. So I'm hoping Maddie will be able to elaborate. Uh, yes. So um, I think ultimately it would depend how much additional storage is deemed to be appropriate are all developments coming forward in the wider catchments going to be providing four weeks worth of storage for any rainfall event that might happen in any given four week period uh, so that's something that would be quite difficult to assess um, and could potentially have an impact on the master plan as as dean has said Okay, I think you got answers to the three questions there. Did you want to come back? Sure. Um, thank you, Chair. It might be difficult to assess, but not impossible. Are you willing to even consider it? Because it doesn't sound like that from the answer you've just given. I mean, it, you might have a master plan now, but that master plan is to change because you need to prevent um, problems for existing communities, then surely that should be the best practice, shouldn't it? Chair, if I can just answer that initially, I think the, the critical thing is here, the improvement on greenfield runoff rates, there will be uh, improvement as a result of the development. And I know that's difficult to kind of comprehend sometimes and um, imagine, but that is the proposal. Um, so in a sense, the worst thing that could happen in terms of um, surface water drainage is the site remains undeveloped because greenfield runoff rates will be flashy in the way that Maddie has explained. There will be significant variation and at times there will be, you know, significant amount of runoff from the site that will be managed as a result of the um, proposals. I, I'm happy to consider a condition where we look at additional storage on site um, uh, Mr. Kelly will have an idea as to how practical that um, is, but um, to some extent, it's also the opposite of what the IDB are also asking for, isn't it? In terms of um, uh, quick discharge, quick discharge requires virtually no storage on site, so we are in danger of covering, you know, multiple um, scenarios here. When I think the the proposal in itself covers the um, the policy requirement and exceeds the policy requirement um, as a bottom line. OK, that's fine. I think you've answered the question there. Um, OK, and a very quick final question from Councillor Bradman, please. 
Thank you. I'm just skirmishing up a few different things that I wanted to check up on. One was um, to do with health provision. And on page 113, there's reference to the health care provision uh, in the heads of terms. And I just wanted to clarify, you, there's, there's an undertaking to provide space, I think, floor space as North Doe grows apportioned to phase B uh, and there's an amount of £900,000 and somewhere else there's reference to a hectareage. Oh no, that's right, that was the other thing, that's faith, but I just wanted to check with you, is there, because the gentleman from Willingham pointed out how very stressed the Long Stanton surgery is, and I just wondered, are, and this is kind of for the officers, but I just wanted to check whether there was any indication that this was going to be dedicated space um, for a doctor's surgery, are we, or are we just talking about spared, shared space for things like injections or whatever? So that's one thing, that what, what is the nature of that health provision likely to be? Um, the other one was, it was on para 153, we're talking about faith space at 33, and I just wanted to check, um, there's a provision for 0 0.1675 hectares <laughs> um, of space, but there's no money for it, and I just wondered whether we have, yes, here we are, paragraph 153, it says, would also like to highlight dedicated faith provision either in phase 3B itself or an extension to the adjacent phase 1 community facility. Uh, and then in the heads of terms, it's referred to at page 113, I think under community, that's right. It's just refers to dedicated faith space. I just wanted some clarification on what, why there is no money associated with the space for faith. I think that might be better directed at officers, to be honest. Yes, um, exactly. I did wonder that. But. Sure. So I will ask if any officers want to come back on that. Um, can I just come back after after the session? Probably helpful. Yeah. I just want to confirm a position on that. Okay, that's Thank fine. Um, all right. Well, with that, members, we've had all our um, questions of clarity for the applicant. So Dean and team, thank you very much for, for that and for fielding all the questions. Um, if you wouldn't mind holding on the line, there may be some questions you might be able to help us with during the debate part of our um, of our meeting this morning. So with that, members, it is coming up to quarter past. If we meet back in 10 minutes, so about 25 past, and we'll, we'll move on with the next round of uh, public speakers. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone. Welcome back to this meeting of South Cam's District Council's Planning Committee. We are just coming to the end of questions of clarification for the applicant. And before the break, we had two questions from Councillor Bradman, which I believe Mr. Kelly uh, was going to come back on. And I'll hand over to him now to do so. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes. Uh, in respect to the question about faith provision, um, South Cam's District Council has actually agreed a process for how we allocate faith uh, provision across uh, new developments. I understand from Claire Flowers, uh, who's, who we've been in contact with, that in March 2020, we uh, Cabinet agreed a process. And essentially, um, we ask for the land to be made available for provision. Uh, and then the council itself goes through a process of bids and consideration of, of um, parties who wish to, wish to get that piece of land to which we then uh, allocate it through that process. Um, in respect of the um, health infrastructure, uh, unfortunately, I don't have any further details than that contained in the schedule. The, the expectation is that the um, phase two, the civic hub on phase two, is the kind of uh, cornerstone of health provision on um, North Stowe. Uh, the uh, health parties have been, the, the health authority have been consulted around the proposals and I think indicated they didn't see a need for provision explicitly on phase 3B. Um, but they are looking at the way that health provision is provided. Obviously, it's a healthy new town across the site as a whole, and we're working, continue to work with them on that. There is scope within the terms of the permissions, in fact, whether it's on phase one uh, or phases 3A or indeed phase two, for floor space to be set aside for those uses. But we're not making explicit provision other than the financial contributions associated with this as to exactly where that happens, because it could happen in a number of locations. OK, sorry, we're going to have to adjourn for a few minutes. We had a medical issue. <laughs>
<coughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Welcome back to this meeting of South Cambridge District Council's Planning Committee. We've just had our lunch break and we are still on the public speaking section of the agenda. Um, before we stopped, um, we had some clarification from Mr. Kelly on two points that Councillor Bradnam raised around uh, faith provision and healthcare provision. Um, Mr. Kelly did respond, but Councillor Bradnam, before we had to stop, I believe he wanted to come back on those points. Yes, if I can just gather my thoughts. Um, yes, it was... Yeah, sorry, I'll come back later if I remember what it was. It, it was I think it was, the, the question was, it's still only 0.1475 of a hectare. No, does that just mean one room um, for, the, for the faith? No, 1 0.1675 hectares, but no money. And, and Mr. Kelly has explained that the district council picks that up at a later stage. Um, oh, I know what it was. Sorry, thank you for bearing with me. Um, it was in paragraphs 169 and 170, um, which in our paper agenda is page 36. This is the, the comment about the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Clinical Commissioning Group. And it says, the justification for a new health centre for North Stowe is well documented. And this letter um, does not repeat these earlier comments, blah, blah, blah but it confirms the need for this application to be responsible for a financial contribution within an S106 agreement towards the construction, fitting out, and revenue costs associated with a new health, health facility. And in the heads of terms, we've got 900,000 pounds. But the question in my mind was, have we allocated enough space in the community hub to allow that 900,000 pounds to be spent productively? I think Mr. Kelly is going to come back on that. I'll, tr I'll try and come back on that. Um, I, the, the simple answer is I can't tell you um, this this second, unfortunately, on on that matter. My understanding is, as the as the paragraph makes clear, the CCG will work, continue to work with um, the planning authority on that. The money is based upon a calculation that they've used. Um, just one second. Um, uh, and the. Um, Contributions are set out in the, in, in, in the schedule, uh, and uh, to my understanding, the, the CCG have been engaged in that conversation as, as appropriate. Can I just clarify? Is that that nine hundred thousand pounds that's on page one one three of the heads of terms for healthcare? That's a contribution to the expansion in phase two, isn't it? It's not provision here in three B or or even three. No, it's not for it's not for explicit provision in this particular phase, the expectation is that it's part of the civic hub in the city in, in phase two. And the and the contribution is proportionate to the impact uh, and the need for additional facilities um, associated with the population of this home. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, well, with that, we're now, after a lot of patience on their part, we move to our parish councillors. Um, starting with Councillor Warren Wright, please, who's speaking on behalf of Swavesey Parish Council. Councillor Wright's been very patient with us as he sat through the entirety of the last meeting just to speak on this item. So we, we thank him for his patience and for coming back again uh, to speak to us today. So. <laughs> So thank you. I'm sure you do, but I do need to ask if you have the authority of your parish council to represent them here this afternoon. Yes, I do. Great. Thank you very much. So as I said to the other public speakers, three minutes to address the committee, at the end of which there may be some questions of clarity from members of the committee for you. So whenever you're ready, please. OK, thank you. Thank you, Mr Chair, members of the committee and officers. <clears throat> Swavesey is an historic linear Fent Edge village with just one road running through the village from the A14-1307 services right through to over. All the village's amenities are along this road, including three working farms and the primary school. We're also home to a Mick George waste disposal site with its associated traffic. 
There is also one road coming in from Fendrayton and of course Ramper Road leading to Northstow and Long Stanton. All these roads were designed to basically take horses and cart movements and enable farmers access to the fields. Ramper Road has already taken an unprecedented increase in traffic, much of which is HGV construction vehicles. Official figures for the last week in November and the first in December show an average of 4,500 plus movements daily with almost 5,500 movements on Friday peaks. We are currently in discussions with Tam Parry and his team regarding this situation and projections of traffic when the North Stowe build out is complete. The carriageway edges are constantly being eroded resulting in many dangerous dips and holes, especially as there are drainage ditches alongside the road. There are also five brick-built culverts underneath Ramper Road, all of which are of an age, a lot older than myself, and probably goes back to when the Dead Sea was only sick. One transfers the water outflow from the Uttonstrove sewage works, and the others transfer suds as crucial to the village drainage system. The collapse of any one of these culverts would cause absolute havoc to our local transport system, not to mention our village drainage system. The Parish Council requests that immediate action is taken to restrict any further increase in traffic using Ramper Road by imposing a ban on any construction vehicles in addition to heavy goods vehicles using this route and that cameras be put into place to enforce this. In addition, that traffic calming measures be installed on both Ramper Road and Boxworth End in order to improve road safety and to deter and restrict further increases in traffic movements when the North Stow build out is complete. Swavis's traffic problems are soon to escalate with the development of a further 70 dwellings in the village, which will only be able to access Middle Watch via a T-junction, which is some 10 yards from the Ramper Road Middle Watch Boxworth End Junction. The village's developing neighbourhood plan indicates that 75% of our residents use their own vehicles to access their workplace and not the guided bus, as so often stated by developers. Furthermore, 850-plus students are bussed into and out of the village college on a daily basis. Plus, the primary school in the village, which is located by the Middle Watch School Lane Junction, and with no official road crossing, currently has more than 300 plus pupils. The Parish Council fully supports and agrees with the IDB statement as presented by Mr. Keith Wilderspin. And there is one, I do have a question for everybody here something which has recently come alight and I think speaks volumes maybe about the developers and what's going on in North Stow. The secondary school in North Stow, which is in its third year now, it's two and a half years in, uh, is in actual fact uh, tankering sewage out of the premises twice a week. Does anybody know what's going on and why this is happening? Have they not got the infrastructure in place so far? And the school has been open for two and a half years. I'm open to any questions. If you can answer that one, I'd be very much obliged. Okay, I will ask members if there's any questions of clarity first of all, please, on your, on your comments. Uh, members, any questions for the parish councillor? No? Uh, sorry. Councillor Hawkins, then Roberts. Uh, thank you, Chair, and through you. Uh, thank you, um, Warren, for your statement. Um, I, I wasn't quite clear about the five culverts that you mentioned and their function in transferring stuff. Can you, exp can you explain that, please? Okay, well, the, the major one is, in actual fact, Utton Strain, which takes all the, uh, the treated water from the um, sewage farm, the sewage works at Upton Strain, which is going to have to take everything from all the North Stowe build out. In addition, it takes everything from um, Camborne, including the two and a half to 3,000 houses that will be built there. And 
Uh, we've had no confirmation yet, but it is, uh, I should say, it's about a thousand to one on odds that it will also have to take a uh, Bourne Airfield site of 4,000 dwellings because the bottom line is that all they will have to do is put a connection line in of about uh, 100 feet underneath the Bourne Airfield Road and it will link into the existing system and bring it all down to Swavesey. So the cumulative effect on the outflow from the sewage farm in Swavesey will be absolutely monstrous in a couple of years. Um, so that is one of the culverts. Uh, and the other four are basically just transferring surface water drainage from around the area. Uh, and what a lot of people don't actually realise, if you look at a map of the area, uh, from you've got the overridge, which then comes down to where, well, obviously phase uh, 3B, Norsto, all the way along uh, the actual Long Stanton bypass, up to Bar Hill, back to Lulworth, and even water from Boxworth and Connington actually flows into the river at Swavesey. And a lot of that actually comes down uh, Ramper Road. Some of it goes the other way into Coval's Drain. So the amount of surface water that, that actually flows through the village is a lot more than people would think. Okay? And, and as I say, there are five culverts underneath Ramper Road uh, bringing thousands of gallons of water through the village to go into the Great River Great Ooze at Webb's Hole Sluice. Thank you for that. Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you, Chairman. Through you, Chairman. Um, good afternoon. Um, we heard that um, something like 194 houses um, in Swavesey have got the potential for flooding. And uh, I took on board that you've just said that you support the uh, concerns of the Internal Drainage Board. Can you remind me, roughly, how many houses you have in Swavesey so we can understand the percentage. I would think it's maybe about 400, but if you could sort of give me a clarification of what house numbers we're talking about. And um, are your residents already aware that they um, are in a situation of uh, potential flooding? And are they finding any difficulty in getting um, insurance for their properties? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I think currently there are something in the region of about the 1,200, maybe 1,250 dwellings. I'm not 100% sure, but it, it is about that figure. Um, we have uh, another well, total development of 70 and another, I believe, about another 20. It's almost another 100 to go with permission, which would take us up to about 13 to 1,400 actual dwellings. And um, are people aware? People are becoming a lot more aware. Um, the uh, paperwork that was sent out regarding the neighbourhood plan has made a lot of people aware of it. Um, a lot of people have moved in, in actual fact, uh, about 19 years ago, we had a big scare and people had moved into a new estate and uh, they were doors were ringing and, and they were asked to move everything upstairs in the village. A lot of people, people tend to uh, expand their houses if they can in Swavesey because they want to stay there, you know, nice thing to say. But um, people are becoming more aware, but I don't think at the moment, uh, I don't know of anybody that's had to uh, had trouble with insuring their premises. But the problem is, as you know, if we do get a flood, and, and we get, say, even 30 or 40 houses that are in actual flat flooded, then everybody in the postcode will have serious trouble getting flood insurance. And we have had a couple, in actual fact, we did have uh, three, four dwellings uh, at the Rampa Road uh, Junction have been, in actual fact, uh, seriously underwater in the last couple of years, last Christmas being the one for a couple of days. Thank you for that. And Councillor Wilson, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, you, you mentioned that um, you have the Mick George Waste Disposal Site in Swavesey. 
Is there another route that those HGVs could take that use A roads rather than using the roads for the village? No, because unfortunately the uh, wastage site is down one of the uh, village byways inside the village. Um, it's by, I don't know if you know Swaves at all, it's by Swan Pond, which was the, uh, the site of the original inland Saxon port. Uh, there is no A road that they can come into, or B road. The only way is either Ramper Road, either through Fendrayton, they'd have to come off of the, uh, at the services junction, or they'd have to come through over. And um, strangely enough, uh, permission was granted last Friday uh, and they have downgraded it to uh, 60 traffic movements a day and they have permission to grade uh, 75,000 tonnes of waste a year. Now that is only uh, 1,500 tonnes a week on a five day week. So there you go, we'll have 300 tonnes of waste coming into the village and you can imagine the size of the vehicles that are going to have to be doing that. And also, uh, Swavesey is a nightmare, especially at the school run now. You, have, you can basically queue up at the Market Street in Swavesey and it can take you 10 or 15 minutes to get down to Doctor's Surgery at the other end of the village, okay? So it is a major thing. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. I don't think there's any further questions of clarity. I have asked your question to officers around the, uh, your question around the school. So they're not in a position to answer that fully today, but we do have an undertaking for them to take that away and come back to you on that. So we don't have an answer today, but one will be provided to you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Bradnam. Thank you, Chair. Um, and through you, I'd like to ask you, um, sort of a combination when was the last time the centre of Swavesey flooded and how frequently does that happen? Uh, it's been the odd problem with odd, odd houses now and again but the last time the major flood in actual fact was uh, 1947. Um, we do have serious uh, aerial photos of that incident and uh, I don't know there wasn't as many houses flooded because there weren't as many houses there now but the sites that were flooded are all developed now thank you so um, did you have any serious flooding in winter 2020 sorry that's Christmas 2020 um, there were five or six yes Winter 2020, there were five or six uh, houses around the Ramper Road Junction with Middle Watch, and there were two, if not three, dwellings further up Box Within that actually had problem with uh, they were they were getting sewage coming in because of the sewage blockage because the uh, lines haven't been flushed out completely, and we do have. Um, we do have a lot of uh, the uh, modern day sandbags from the council uh, to, to give out and a lot of houses do have them as a preparation. Thank you, Chair. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, there's no further questions or clarification for yourself. So thank you very much again for being so patient with us. Um, and we will move on now to our next public speaker, who is Councillor Paul Littlemore, who's speaking on behalf of North Stowe Town Council and should be joining us online. Councillor Littlemore, are you with us? Hello, Chair. I hope you can Hello hear there, me. good afternoon. <laughs> Excellent. So before we kick off, can I just double check that you have the permission of your town council to represent them here today? Yes, I do, yeah. Great. Um, and as with other public speakers, three minutes to address the committee, and then there may be some questions of clarity for you at the end. So if you stay on the line, that'll be handy. Perfect. Thank you, Chair. Whenever you're ready, please. OK, so North Stoke Town Council objects to this application in its current form. Our written comments outline several areas where, in our opinion, improvements and strict planning conditions are required for this application to be acceptable. Our principal concern is around site access, both for residential and for construction traffic. 
the current plans accommodate only one route in and out for motor vehicles on the B1050 roundabout. The other potential, potential entry and exit points identified in the planning documents through either endurance estates or digital park are not guaranteed to be delivered as the applicant does not own these plots. We seek clarification of access plans to ensure that this junction does not become a bottleneck and uh, as the only confirmed entry point is not deemed to be sufficient to support a thousand houses. We'd also like to see a clear strategy for separation of residential and construction traffic uh, during the phases of construction, which wouldn't leave roadways and cycle paths unfinished until 3B is complete in its entirety, as we've seen in phase one. We're also concerned as to how the new development will affect traffic on the B1050. This road is already, in our opinion, close to capacity and an extra 1,000 houses will significantly add to the traffic already using it. We request that an adequate traffic monitoring plan be put in place and mitigation measures are documented uh, which can be imposed if this road does become overwhelmed. On the hotly, uh, on the discussion points around groundwater and drainage, we note the concerns from other consultees uh, about the Swayze drain being able to cope with the outflows from phase 3B in addition to that of 3A and Utton's Drove. Given the long-standing concerns in the community around drainage strategy and groundwater levels, we would request that agreement from these consultees be sought prior to approval. We also agree with Longstanton Parish Council's comments around the building heights along the B1050 that face Longstanton Village, in that these should be a maximum of two storeys rather than three to limit the visual impact from Longstanton Village. On construction management, we request that there's an adequate SEMP in place prior to the start of any construction, in this case with specific restrictions to prohibit construction traffic going through Longstanton, Willingham or Northstow Phase 1, as well as to mitigate noise and dust. Until these concerns are addressed and conditions put in place to mitigate them, North Stowe Town Council cannot support this application. And thank you for your time today. Thank you very much for those comments. Uh, members, any questions of clarification for the Town Councillor? Councillor Bradman, then Roberts. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry, I do apologise. I can't read Littlemore, thank you, Mr. Littlemore. Um, if we uh, were to seek restriction of traffic uh, so that it didn't go through um, uh, North Stowe Phase 1, Willingham or Longstanton, which route would it use? So that would be that would be the B1050 straight out towards the A14. Okay, so there is a, there is a possible route, okay. That's fine. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Chairman. Um, good afternoon, Councillor Littmore. Um, you said that you would want to see a condition um, implemented and put into place and implemented regarding the concerns about the water. Um, and are you meaning also that, that, that I think you said that agree, uh, you know, it had to be uh, an agreement before it happened. Are you including the internal drainage board in that consideration? Yes, I am. Yeah, I, I think all part or, or the council's opinion is that all parties should be in agreement prior to approval. But if you sought to seek that as a condition, um, personally, I would probably find that acceptable. But I can't comment on behalf of the council because we, we didn't discuss that. OK, thank you very much. I don't think there's any further questions for you. So thank you very much for joining us this afternoon for your time. Uh, Members, or for those watching, it's also probably worth noting Long Stanton Parish Council have sent in written comments, which committee members have had sight of. Um, so just because they're not here today doesn't mean they haven't made comments on this application. So I just wanted to make that clear. Uh, and also on that note, the local members, Councillor Chung Johnson and Mallion, have also sent in written comments, uh, again, which committee members have had sight of um, and I trust to take into consideration when we make a decision today. Okay. With that, members, that concludes uh, our public speakers. We're now moving into the debate. Um, as agreed at the beginning, we're going to try and structure this uh, in sections for, for I hope, smoothness. Um, we're beginning with sections one and two of the report, which relates to the principle of development, land use and vision, and the parameter plans. Uh, obviously, members, we do have officers with us in the room and online. Um, if we do need any any further questions to uh, on on any of these sections, 
to help us, but also we can give points of view across as well. Councillor Heather Williams, please. Um, thank you. <coughs> Sorry. Um, my, my comments uh, relate quite a bit to section two and led to my, my line of questioning earlier. <clears throat> the, I, I am very concerned with the ability to be go, able to go up to three buildings so close to Longstanton. Um, and I, I understand what they're saying it's up to, they might not, but I think we do have to work on the basis of what we're approving is that they could put three story buildings across there. Um, as, you know, we can't really say yes, but we hope you don't use it. Although I think I have said that in the past when it, when the council's a tenant, but for this, and when you look at the other boundaries, you know, there's been a significant buffer and I'm, I'm thinking to policy NH1, uh, which says a conservation area and green separation at Longstanton. And when I heard the representative, it's like there's going to be five metres, right? Or 77 metres, including the road. Um, that, that concerns me. I think you can probably have um, things closer than what they have been in other areas, but it isn't a great deal of green space um, in between. I would have been much happier had there been a sort of tiered approach sort of we can see that obviously it is possible to have up to two stories because there's a very very tiny bit of it just around the station road area had that extended along um i think that would have been much more satisfactory um you know we are putting a lot of houses on that on that piece and with existing residents there um, and they're going to have a lot to contend with and they're the ones that are going to have to live with it. And I don't think it's unreasonable um, from the, what the representatives are saying. And from a design point of view as well, we know we've got some four-storey peaks in there, um, but I, I'm in, if that makes sense. We've seen it on, I think it was on Water Beach and other places where you literally, you're building in, you're almost creating a sort of mountain effect in itself and then you get your landmark buildings or, or whatever we want to call them. Um, so I think the principle of development chair, you know, we all accept that this is the right place for housing, um, but how that housing is done is, is still up for question. Um, and I'm not convinced on those plans as it is right now. Um, I think there's too much flexibility. I know they say design plan, but essentially we would be allowing up to three storeys, which means we are allowing three storeys across all of that, and I'm not not satisfied with that, Chair. Okay. Thank you for those comments. Uh, next speaker, Councillor Bradman, please. Uh, yes, in fact, that's what I was going to raise. Um, I would like to see um, a wider buffer um, between the existing houses in the station road area, between the backs of those houses and the start of the up to three storey buildings. So I'd like to see a wider gap, um, sorry, not a gap, but a wider area when they would still just be two storey. Um, I can see some of the properties on station road itself are actually three storey, but I think one of the concerns that our, our local members raised was a need to maintain a green separation between these areas. And I just think it would be preferable if we could have lower buildings on this frontage between um, the, develop the new development and the existing development at Station Road. Um, and I, I just think we should be looking at that. And I wondered whether we could explore whether that's possible. Mr. Kelly might want to comment on this. I just, uh, I mean, I think I understand what you're, what, what you're, what you're highlighting. The, the slight, uh, there's, there's two things. The parameter plans are one of only uh, a handful of documents that are, that are being part of the process of consent for an application like this. Um, uh, and I'm hearing a concern around the heights of those buildings along uh, particularly the edge of the, the, edge of the site. Um, the slight challenge is that 
actually onto the areas of open space, there's a, there are two elements to the parameter plans along um, uh, the B1 at 1050. Uh, the first is where the open space um, uh, uh, comes down from the central cops, and the second is at the site entrance. Um, in some respects, the, the, uh, there is a reasonably strong argument for at least highlighting those points in the um, uh, site's edge where people would then turn in where the entrance is into the site and so on without making a substantial gateway. Um, because otherwise, uh, in fact, the two stories that are in the parameter plan is only seven metres high, which is in fact lower than two stories on North Stowe phase one, which are up to nine metres. Um, there are two... There, Trying to think through, well, um, if the committee are minded and have a concern that they want to see two-storey uh, buildings um, uh, along that frontage, uh, then um, there is arguably scope to qualify the um, parameter plan uh, with a condition, for example, notwithstanding the details of the parameter plan of whatever reference number it is, um, uh, all buildings along the site frontage of the B1050. I, I mean, there's... I shan't go into the wording now, but there is a way, I think, of crafting a condition that would create the first 10 or 20 metres into that site to be no more than two storeys. Well, that would be splendid, but the that would be the most welcome, I think. But actually, uh, and, and I am absolutely allergic to, um, there is a phrase in planning which refers to a sense of arrival. Um, in other words, big buildings on the edges. But the bit I was actually concerned about was this, sorry, I'm showing you on my... Thing. It's this little strip around the back of this quadrant on Station Road, which is the only bit that is two-storey. I and mean, remember, the case officer took some time to show us it. And I'm just wondering if that could be a bigger area of just two-storey to protect those houses on the Station Road area from being overlooked quite so... I know it's not technically overlooking, but it's just that feeling of being very close by whether we could just make that um, area of two-storey buildings a bit wider. Just two comments on, on that. The, the first is um, certainly the two-storey buildings that are shown in these parameter plans are in fact lower than the houses that are on that phase of development, um, which are up to nine metres in height, as I understand it. I think it's hard to justify from a kind of either a landscape perspective, because obviously the setting is those existing houses. Clearly, one of the things that we're not, we haven't got in front of us and one of the key pieces of work that will happen in the event that a consent is granted is a piece of work around the design codes for, for this site. The whole site will be coded in which the, in, the relationship between those two sets of properties will obviously be worked through and there'll be consultation with the town and parish councils uh, but also with those local communities. I think there's a danger of um, predetermining what that um, acceptable arrangement looks like and how far it would be necessary to take three stories or two story homes back into the site. I think the, the, the parameter plan is trying to convey the fact that those properties will only look onto properties of a similar size and format as indeed they, they, they already do in relation to those within the site. Um, I don't think it would be reasonable to, uh, if, unless there was a landscaping argument to argue for that in that case, and the landscape appraisal that accompanies the application identifies that obviously as you get uh, somewhat different in some respects the B1050, but as you get close to the properties on that part of the landscape, the influence of North Stowe Phase 1 and all of its infrastructure actually really doesn't create a, a, a case for, for limiting uh, the form of development there. Um, Thank you. A fair point. I'll take your point on that. Um, but you, you, <coughs> Mr. Kelly, you also mentioned the. I think your mic might have died, Anna. Oh. Okay. So um, I was thinking about the frontage onto the B1050. 
And in the same way that I don't particularly like arrival buildings that tell you you've got somewhere, um, I would like us, if possible, to maintain the hedge along the B1050 wherever it's possible. I don't know if the landscaping currently allows for that, but um, if it's possible to do that, I'd like to think we could. Is that a possibility? Yeah, so, so um, it doesn't propose its removal at this moment in time, obviously, say for it approves an access point into the broad site. Um, as I said, it's an element really for the design coding. In fact, in the break, I was just looking at Campbell and West design coding. And, and clearly, these types of considerations in terms of breaks and views and vistas into the site are matters that the design coding process can consider. Um, and certainly, there's nothing in the application, as far as I can see, that requires substantial removal of that hedgerow at this moment in time. Splendid. Thank you. Thank you for that. Councillor Wilson. Councillor Wilson, please. Thank you. Um, I want to um, refer to the movement of construction vehicles. Um, this is a... Probably a, the next section, I think, Councillor, on right, access and sorry, transport. Okay. Uh, so, members, we're still on sections one and two, which is principle of development, land use and vision and parameter plans. Okay. Councillor Williams is on this, these two sections. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, it was just on this section, I just wanted to clarify the area that I was referring to where I think that the two-storey, there should be um, two storeys sort of phasing it in, um, is actually the impact it has on kid, uh, Kids Crescent and Eaton Way and Loft House Way. It's, so it's a Long Stanton side as opposed to the Station Road current North Stow. It's the impact on Long Stanton along, I think that's the B1050, along that road there, that's my concern as opposed to with the sort of other phase of North Stow, because we seem to focus on the station road area. So just wanted to clarify, that's my area of concern, Chair. Well, if Mr Kelly could clarify, that was part of his comments earlier. Yeah, so that was what I was, I was um, referring to when I said there is, obviously it's in the parameter plan as three storey, you could um, qualify that. Uh, any consent by reference to some form of a condition that prevented it um, from being higher than two storeys for a depth into the site. Um, were you minded to do that? I think the, the only uh, point I would make is whether or not it's desirable to achieve effectively buildings with taller buildings behind it, particularly when you get to those open space, when you get to the open space break point and the, and the access point. But um, that would, my comments were recognising your concern around the relationship with Long Stanton. Okay, thank you. Okay, no more speakers on sections one and two, members. Oh, sorry, Councillor Hales, before we move on. Thank you, Chair. It's just something Mr Kelly just said. Um, this is obviously the outline, yeah? So when would the reserve matters be taken? Because I think, if I remember, the applicant said somebody said on the screen that it was possibly within this decade right so that's quite a while um some of us may not be here some of the top table may not be here and I, i'm kind of wary that we are here we are today um and if we have thoughts that we would like to condition now that perhaps in the future future colleagues and what have you might say well they say they don't, they don't apply anymore so we might change them when it comes to reserve matters, but to put the protections in now that we've heard people talk about. So I'm just wondering whether that was lawful, um, looking at Mr. Reid, um, uh, and whether, whether it's um, the will of this committee. Thank you. I don't know if any of the officers want to come back on, on that particular point regarding conditioning now just just to, just to give you a heads up i'm talking about like the hedgerows and the and the, the councillor bradman was talking about i'm talking about the two or three story buildings whether or not we do that now. if i could just it, obviously the use of conditions is defined in terms of what you can use them for uh is is um set out quite clearly in the legislation you're quite right that the applicants i understand don't intend to get to this element of the scheme and for um, at least five to eight years before we start to see development happening. Um, and as I said, there is a design code process and approval of reserve matters to follow. If you, however, on an outline planning permission, if you want to define the parameters of the 
um, all of those subsequent operations, then you need to impose conditions at this stage of the process. Um, imposing a condition for the, that applies a limitation to the grant of permission is entirely consistent with the use and purposes of conditions as long as they satisfy the tests, including they're reasonably related in scale and kind to the development uh, and they serve a planning purpose. Um, I don't know if Mr. Reid wants to comment further. I think I'd just add that notwithstanding Mr. Kelly's comment, uh, if you did impose a condition, it would still be open to the applicant to appeal the condition, in which case then it, matter, it, it may be that, that uh, matter would, the condition and its reasonableness, et cetera, would be tested in a planning appeal. Okay, so with that, members, moving on to section three of the report, which deals uh, solely with access and transport. So, Councillor Wilson, I think you had a, a question around vehicle movements, and then Councillor Bradnam. Thank you. My apologies for that jumping the gun. Um, yeah, this is something I brought up um, when we were discussing um, phase 3A, is that um, the construction vehicles leave the site and go along the B1050 to the A14, and then they can then rat run through other villages on their way to wherever they're going. Um, at the moment, there's a, a gravel pit that's um, being um, exploited at Water Beach. And we've been told, we've been, it's been, that the HGVs going between the gravel pits and the construction sites will not go through Cottenham. They are going through Cottenham. So I would like to see some sort of condition that none of those HGVs that are ferrying gravel from that gravel pit at Water Beach to the construction sites or returning the soil to the land, to fill, backfill the land at Water Beach can go down any roads such as the, um, the Dry Drayton and Oakington Road or the B1049, that they must go along the A14 and the A10. Okay, Mr. Kelly's coming in. Uh, just, to, just to say, um, uh, because we recall the conversation that we had last time around um, systems, um, I think condition 39 on the construction uh, environmental management plan, um, I think might be tweaked slightly under uh, part C of that, uh, to um, we did talk about whether it's ANPR or geo, uh, you know, GPS-based kind of monitoring. Um, uh, but I think if there's a concern around it, um, you could uh, insert because I think one of the speakers also asked for ANPR um, uh, into Part C after signage strategy um, a, a requirement for control systems because, as you recall, we discussed well actually is it ANPR or is it uh, GPS monitoring and so on. Um, I, I think your point also goes to, though, and I'd like Tam Parry to comment, if he can, around the approach to managing traffic through villages. Clearly, we can only put a condition on this development and the way that um, um, the, uh, construction traffic arises from, from that, and you've, you've highlighted the issues on Water Beach. But, Tam, I wonder if you can um, outline the approach from the county's perspective on how we'll um, seek to manage through traffic, particularly heavy vehicles beyond just the site entry and exit, which I know is, is the concern. Hi, yes. Um, so in terms of heavy vehicles, the key way that we, we look to manage those is, is really through the construction environment management plan that we've just been talking about. And up until now, the, the plan is focused on the route of access being the B1050 um, and the A14. Um, and then for phase two, the, the seven access road rest of the new road being built by Homes England from Bar Hill into North Day, um, from which there is a, a construction access route into the town. So it's reasonable to, to add to that condition that um, con all construction vehicles should be approaching using main roads, perhaps um, uh, the A14, A10. Um, and any other A roads in the surrounding area and, and no B roads or, or minor roads. Um. 
Okay, does that answer your question in part, Councillor? Um, yes, I'm very interested in the ANPR and solution because um, although um, I have been advised by um, Mick George that the HDVs won't be going through our village, um, it's very difficult to prove that they are when they're going so fast and quite often their registration plates are covered in mud. So I, I've got lots of villagers looking out for numbers and times so that I can report back but it's, pr it's proved almost impossible so far. So I think the AMPR and GPS solution would be very welcome. Although if you've got a muddy license plate, the AMPR probably wouldn't pick it up either, but there you go. But um, I see Mr. Kelly's beavering away editing conditions for us at my side. So before we make any decisions on anything, we'll obviously run through all the various conditions we're editing and adding just to make sure everyone's content with what we've we're talk been talking about today. Councillor Williams, please. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I think it's Heather. Uh, Councillor Bradnam, apologies. Thank, thank you, and it's a pertinent time, thank you, Chair, because that's a similar thing to what I was going to ask, which was to pick up on the representation from the local member for the talking, Councillor Bill Handley, at paragraph 113, and also later on uh, in paragraph 122, where variously the members are saying, please, could we avoid construction management, uh, construction traffic going through the villages of Longstanton, Willingham, or over. Um, and could we add that to condition 39, which is on our page 144? Could we make it explicit, not just A and B roads, but could we just say um, that they shouldn't, construction management traffic shouldn't, sorry, construction traffic should not go through the villages of Longstanton, Willingham, or indeed the other one that was raised was North Stowe Phase 1. Clearly that would be very unwelcome. And could the um, uh, gentleman from the Parish Council said, could there be monitoring on the B1050 to monitor the weight of traffic on the B1050 to see if this was working um, so that you know, we protect our existing villages Not sure if any officers want to come back on that point. Tam, I see you've appeared. Yes, I like a genie in a bottle. Um, yes, so um, in terms of monitoring, we're looking to put some sensors around North Stowe that will pick up number plates of vehicles. It anomalizes the number plates, but it does help you to help us to be able to track vehicles and where they go. So I can broadly tell hopefully in the future when the system's in place the routes of vehicles that they're taking and the class of vehicles so whether it's a car or HGV so I'd be able to say to to, 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 to South Camps there are lorries going from North Stowe through Oakington for instance um, but I couldn't tell you what their number plates are but we can just no, I'm, I'm not asking about sorry mm. sorry, sorry I didn't mean to interrupt I'm not asking about number plates. I'm asking for a transport management plan that says vehicles coming to and from this site for this purpose of building this new phase should not go through Longstanton, Willingham or North, North Stowe Phase 1. Okay, I think yep. we've got um, Mr Kelly's taking note of that and I think he's having a look to see whether it's possible to actually identify villages that construction traffic can't go through. Now, Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Thank you Chair. Um, so I was just going to suggest that for consistency that we did apply a condition last time on the other phase. I, I personally would like to see a like for like um, condition uh, that mirrors what we did. That way we're consistent. We gave ourselves flexibility if new technologies came along rather than being prescriptive. I can understand the desire to, to list villages, but I think actually that might open the gate to justifying that it can be in other villages. I think the traffic management plan, there is a very, for this, a very simple, easy method, A14, B1050. You know, it, it can be done very smoothly. It's n not as complicated as some of the other areas we've seen. So I think we want, with the traffic management plan, yeah, that will come forward, we'll get those details. Um, but I think we should be mirroring what we said said last time um, in that conditioning. 
um, but like I say, if, if we if we list and then you know we've not said Lulworth, which is or Swavesy, or I think if we start listing villages, we could get ourselves unintentionally um, then actually sort of almost excusing displacement elsewhere. So I would be a bit nervous on on that score, Chair. Okay, no, thank you for that. Appreciate that comment. Um, okay, members, transport, highways. Any further comments or debate on this? No. Okay. So we're moving on, members, to the next three sections, sections four, five, and six. Is this on highways? Okay. It was just um, the, the bit I raised before under the village traffic management. I, I think it's under this phase, which was in the he heads of terms. Is that, that was £10,000, I think, for assessment, wasn't it? So if we needed, it would be linked. The reason I'm raising it now is it would be linked to that condition that we're just talking about. So um, because obviously if we're making by condition 39, we're making it obvious that we want the vehicles to go on V1050 onto the A14, then let's hope they won't go through the other villages. But And thus, hopefully, traffic calming uh, would not be required. But I, we can see that that might be needed depending on the flexibility of the condition 39 so i'm just hoping that that provision in the heads of terms is going to be sufficient to deal with the problems that might arise as the construction goes ahead okay yeah i think that is that's what it's for mm. um i don't know if any officers want to clarify that i don't think it's not, not necessary but uh, if tam perhaps wants to yeah, happy to. Yeah. So the overall between phase 3A and 3B, there's £900,000 to, to, to um, address the potential impact of traffic in the villages surrounding the North Stow. So the intention there is that the, the larger villages like Longstanton, Willingham, Swavesea, Girton, Oakington would receive the, 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 uh, more of a share of the funding than the smaller villages. Um, the intention is to... Um, disincentivise traffic from using roads that go through the villages and encourage the traffic to go where it should be, which is on the A14 um, and the major roads around the area, not not the little roads going through the villages. So really the same applies to the HGVs. If there are traffic coming measures that we can do, um, colleagues of mine would be ex would find acceptable to limit HGV movements, then, then they're also on the table with this funding. Okay, thank you, Tim. That's clear. Yep. All right, members, with that, we will move on now to the next sections, which are four, five, and six, which relate to employment assessment, housing delivery and social, housing delivery and social and community infrastructure. Uh, I don't think we've had much debate on this so far, to be honest, members, but if anyone does wish to raise anything now, this is the opportunity. That's the next. Yeah. Councillor Bradman, please. Um, I think I've understood the application correctly to say that there will be 40% affordable housing on this um, development and I just wanted to say I'm very glad to see that and I would hope that that wasn't eroded as the development builds out which has sometimes happened in other um, developments so I'm very glad to see the 40%. Good, thank you. Anything further members? No. Okay, we'll move on to the final grouping of sections, which is sections seven to ten, and then incorporate environmental considerations, the cumulative impact, financial obligations, and the planning balance. Um, okay, members, over to you. Councillor Roberts, then Richard Williams, please. Yes, um, and here it comes, the elephant in the room. I don't think I can go along with this application uh, as it stands. I think that we have a responsibility to those people who are there already, first and foremost, as opposed to building houses for people who aren't there and businesses that aren't there. And there are so many question marks over the water problems uh, that uh, it seems to me that this is absolutely premature. There may be solutions, but they're not there yet. 
and the thought of the possibility of nearly 200 houses going underwater at Swavesey, um, they will be using that port again, won't they? Um, at the end of the village, at the over end of the village. Um, it just seems to me that it is a disaster waiting to happen. Um, we seem to have a developer who is I think admitted that uh, the provision of houses, you know, all these houses that we need for these people who don't actually exist in the, in the district uh, is their main consideration. Um, I don't think it's actually the main consideration of us as a planning committee. We are there to balance it out. But at the moment, I think that there is such a possibility of um, a real disaster waiting for Swavesey um, that uh, we should either defer this. And it's such a great disappointment to hear the fact that the Internal Drainage Board told us that, I know, yes, we've had COVID, but there's been no um, real meeting of physically on mines since 2019. Um, and yet here we have this thing in front of us today. Um, I think if we could defer it and let all these people get round a table, I just think that the developers are treating the internal drainage board as though it's a complete sort of non-important, non-entity. And in fact, I think it's the most important factor in the expertise um, that is actually in front of us. Um, the internal drainage boards have been keeping those areas safe from flooding for decades and decades now, and they've got a very intimate and knowledgeable understanding of the situation around those villages, which is, you know, it is there. Um, there is a huge amount of, of water that needs to be um, sorted out, moved about, contained and then released. And I think at this moment in time, we, we need to get that sorted out first. Um, it may hold this back for a, a, a while, um, but I think that's how it should be. Um, I think, as I say, we have, we have a moral responsibility here um, to actually make sure that we are not putting something in place there that is absolutely going to um, cause havoc in another area. So I, I think, um, I don't know whether anybody's happy if we deferred it, um, Otherwise, I shall be definitely voting against it. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, thank you. Richard Councillor Richard Williams, please. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, actually, Councillor Roberts has, has said a lot of, 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 of what I was going to say. Uh, I am very worried about this drainage issue. I mean, one thing that, that, that's really come across to me, both in the previous application and this application, is how delicate the area that we're dealing with here is it is not a place that is naturally dry. We are dealing with a place where you have to pump the water up to the level of the river. I, th I think, you know, you just look at it and you think, oh, it's just, you know, just land like everywhere else. But, but it's not. Um, it, it only stays that way um, because of the work of people on the Internal Drainage Board and, and, and a lot of other people to, to, to keep it that way. So we're dealing with an extremely sensitive um, landscape. Um, and a very sensitive area. We, we are putting more and more development there. I do feel it's, it's a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. You know, we talk about Bourne, we talk about Camborne, we talk about North Stowe. But it, it, it's cumulative, uh, and it is having um, an effect. And I feel it's a little bit reckless to approve applications like this without being absolutely sure and without having the experts on the ground telling us that it's safe to do it. I don't say that lightly, but I do think it's reckless um, to carry on approving these, these applications. Now, at minimum, I would want a condition um, along the lines of what we talked about earlier, that the uh, water could be stored on, I mean foul water as well as surface water, um, could be stored on site uh, when it couldn't be um, when the sluice gate was closed and when it, when it couldn't be pumped into, into the ooze um, at Swavesey. I think that would be a minimum. And personally, I would like it conditioned that development wouldn't commence until the uh, IDB was satisfied um, that, it was, that it was safe. Um, 
certainly without that condition, that, that, that there is no way um, I, I could support this. Um, I, I'm just, I just think it, it, it's far too risky. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Bradham. Thank you, Chair. Well, we've had a lot of discussion about this, and even from the last time we looked at 3A, this came into our thoughts as well. But we cannot escape the fact that, and I will read them out in turn as they appear in our agenda papers, paragraphs 163, 164, the lead local flood authority has said they had no objection in principle. Um, and you know, providing there are conditions to ensure that uh, the, the surface water is managed properly. At paragraph 175, um, the Environment Agency advises that there are no concerns that, sorry, advises that the concerns that were raised against a number of planning applications relating to Uttams Drove have been addressed and that there is no material reason in terms of foul water drainage to prevent permissions being granted. Um, at paragraph 441, um, we're advised that there are discussions ongoing, and we, that was confirmed, although there had been um, a difference in opinion as to whether discussions had been had. There was an undertaking, we heard verbally today, between the Lead Local Flood Authority, the Internal Drainage Board, and um, the uh, which other authority, Lidlo, yes, and the Swave Sea Internal Drainage Board to discuss how the water would be managed at the Swave Sea drain and at the um, and the outflows from Uttams Drove and what would be happen, happening at Webb's Hole Sluice. So, my feeling is that in the past, um, drainage wasn't perhaps managed as well it is, as it is now. I know, you know, historically we're thinking about drains through our landscape um, and we're worried that things are being changed. But actually, drainage planning is much better now than it used to be. And I think, given none of the st statutory authorities have objected, whilst we may feel nervous about this, we have to trust the judgment of the statutory authorities. Um, and if the Lead Local Flood Authority and the Environment Agency are not concerned about the outflows, uh, then I think, for myself, I think we have to trust their expertise in this. Um, I notice, and this isn't a criticism, but I notice that the person speaking to us from the Swathe Sea Internal Drainage Board was indeed the chair of the in Internal Drainage Board, but not the chief engineer. And so I just wondered if perhaps there was a difference in understanding between the chief engineer and, and I'm not saying a dispute, I'm just saying a difference in understanding. So my, my um, I'm sure the gentleman, the chair, spoke to us from his heart and from his own knowledge of the locality. And indeed, you will remember, I asked him a number of questions about the locality, but if the drainage board is being reassured in these discussions, I think we must take the statutory authority's view that they will take steps that are necessary to make sure it's, uh, that the water is handled properly. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, looking at this as, as a whole, um, there are merits, like, and it is a balance. I think we need to recognise that. You know, it does live affordable housing. That's good to see. Um, and it is part of our local plan and our land supply. Um, so, we're, so we're balancing that against the drainage issues and the environmental issues and, uh, for myself in particular, the height issues that, that it brings. Um, so I don't think it's, it's particularly clear cut, but I am myself going towards the side of refusal, mainly based on the drainage issues and the heights of the buildings. So for, I would ask that if committee is minded to approve that they do, as was suggested, um, I can't say alter the parameter plan, but sort of condition about the heights, if we could have that in place um, in case it goes ahead. Um, I, you know, I, I'm not going to challenge anybody's understanding of drainage because probably most people have it better than I. Um, but uh, we've um, 
had significant concerns from from the internal drainage board at Swavesey. Um, and we've also heard of the impact our decision today could make on residents there. And when I look through on the consultation, you know, and it's not just internal um, drainage board that has objected, we have local district councillors that um, are asking for conditions or are unhappy with, with things. We have, I think, every single parish council objecting um, which isn't always the case. We've seen throughout the different phases of North Stowe, actually, quite often we've had a lot of support through this. We even have objections from CamCycle and the, and the British Horse um, Society to do with facilities there. So it's not it's not a case of everybody's um, um, so. On balance, Chair, I think I'll be voting for refusal, but would like the conditions and around the transport um, to mirror that what we did before about construction um, traffic. And I would say actually about whatever route it is, if there is some monitor and manage about the state. Because quite often what we have is um, we ask construction traffic to go a certain route, those roads get broken up and then. Sorry, another microphone issue, I'm afraid. Uh, Are you back? Am I back? I think I'm back. Um, so the residents are then left with a deteriorated road due to construction traffic. So thinking everyone can hear what I've said in the room at least. Um, if we could make sure that there is some protections in place so any damage caused from the construction on the existing road infrastructure is, is repaired. Because I think that particularly aggravates residents when that doesn't happen. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And obviously, before we take a decision on anything, we'll also run through the re potential reasons for refusal and potential conditions should it be approved. Martin. Councillor Martin Cohen. <coughs> I've been going back and forth on this uh, for the issue of drainage. It's, a, it's just complicated. But the uh, position, uh, the, the council has taken the decision that this area uh, earlier on is to be developed. So uh, this is an outline decision. So it's not, uh, load, uh, many things can be covered in later reserved matters. So the real issue to me is, is this drainage issue, can it be resolved? Um, the, uh, and what, in planning terms, have we got um, are, are reasonable consider, uh, conditions, matters which we can consider for refusal? Um, the issue of sewage seems to be a bigger problem really than runoff drainage. Um, the, the additional sewage, but that's something which the uh, the, the relevant authority says it can cope with. Uh, uh, it, we are in a difficult position refusing it uh, if they say they can cope with it. Um, I'm, we're, we're just practically, if the body responsible for taking the sewage says it can be managed, we have to, we, we, it, we'd have to be really, really sure of our matters if we, um, if, if we, to, to, and more details of actually how it was going to cope with to be able to turn it down. In terms of the, mat, the, the runoff from the site, um, as I expressed, I'm concerned in the future that we will, may have positions where we really would prefer to have no, no water going off. Uh, but uh, as the developer proposed, uh, commented, the design is, uh, is such that it would not be more than the existing water running off the site. Now, that's not really, um, and I don't think we can actually require more than that in, our, in, a, in, a, um, in any condition. We, uh, it does seem to me that they've got quite large areas of storage, uh, and I think we could make a, perhaps make a note that we would want to make sure that, that, that there is scope for increasing should at a future date it be required. Um, and certainly that should be possible within the reserve matters, I would have thought, to, be able to provide for that. But uh, I find it difficult to feel that, that if I went to appeal, that that would be a, a matter which would be, would stand up uh, against, um, on the site which we would allocate for development, and which they have 
provided a site a, a, a solution which is accepted by the statutory authorities that they do not exceed the runoff than in, on the existing site. So, while I am very concerned, I find it difficult to find that we've got strong enough reasons to, to turn it down on that, and, uh, and or that the matters I think can be dealt with by uh, by, by conditions. So I, I, I've come round in the end, and, and I was not sure at the beginning of this discussion. I've come round to the end, and I feel that we probably that, that we, we should accept this. In terms of other matters, I'm not particularly worried. I'm not so worried about the three-storey dwellings, but uh, obviously that matters to some people, and I'm not unhappy about it if people want to put a condition. Um, I think much more important is the quality of the design that comes in the reserve matters along the, along the, along the, along the boundary, uh, uh, rather than the actual height of the building. It's a, if it's a good design, then it will, and there's an adequate distance, which uh, with the uh, 70 metres plus 30 metres at the back, uh, strip in, the, in, in the private land on the other side, I think that will be adequate. So um, uh, that, that to me is more of a matter, but if people want to, that's something that's important to people, that's something important to people, it's not something that will worry me particularly. Um, I, I had concerns about the transport access to this other end, I thought it might be a potential, but it's clear it's not something that's easily going to be able to, to, to impose since there's, there's no control of land. So um, otherwise, I think those other matters I'm, I'm happy with. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Rickliffe, please. Um, a lot of what I was going to say has been covered, so I'll be really brief. Um, and it's all about planning balance, as a lot of people have already said. And um, this is part of our allocated local plan. It isn't a kind of speculative development that's cropped up somewhere. And you also have to look at what will be delivered in this development and how that makes um, the whole of North Stow as well is a part of a jigsaw and um, based probably on the type of conditions and as long as we look carefully at the conditions I think I will be voting in favour. Um, Thank you. Councillor Richard Williams please. Thank you, Chair. Just a point of uh, information and clarity for the committee, which, which might help give them some early, earlier comments. Um, I've been told by the Chair of the Internal Dra Drainage Board that the letter of objection was actually written by the Internal Drainage Board's Chief Engineer. So I think we can be satisfied on that score. Thank you very much. Well, that's, that's useful. Thank you. And Councillor Roberts. Please. Just a, a very quick one, Chairman, and I should have thought of this at the, my first round, so thank you very much for just letting me join in again. The thing about responsibility is ownership. And I'm sorry, I don't think the Anglia water is anywhere near as important as the Internal Drainage Board. Because at the end of the day, the responsibility will be dumped upon, literally dumped upon the Internal Drainage Board. Anglia water have said really very little. It's okay by them. Well, it will be, won't it? Because they won't have to deal with it, really. Um, it will be others. Um, and the people who are most concerned, and I believe rightly most concerned, are the Internal Drainage Board, uh, the Parish Council, and the villages of Swayze. And, okay, it may be in our local plan. It may be an allocated site. But it doesn't mean that you just willy-nilly ignore a major problem that has been put in front of you. I don't think any of us have said today nothing ever, never, ever. But what I am saying and what colleagues on either side of me are saying is that this is premature. Um, and there are always solutions to problems. That's what problems are about. They're, they're about finding solutions. But we haven't got a solution in front of us. We've got experts pointing us out what they see. They, they see it day in and day out because they're running that internal drainage board every single day of the week, every single day of the month, every single day of the year. They know that area inside out. So this is not ready. It's just not ready. Um, and we have a responsibility. Why on earth do any of us 
put up for election, give ourselves the power to do things or to make sure things are done properly, and then negate that responsibility. Because any of you who vote for this today are actually, once again, saying, well, you know, there's nothing much we... We had this a, a month ago. Well, there's nothing much we can do about it. It's not our problem. Well, it is your problem. Every single one of us as elected councillors, it is our problem. Please, you know, don't negate what you are here for. You're not here to willy-nilly give developers lots of money in their back pockets. You're here to protect the land and the people you represent. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Khan, you wanted to come back with another point. I just wanted to come back on this and the big problem seems to be the sewage rather more than the actual runoff. That, 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 that the problem. Uh, uh, and I agree, I'm worried about it. But basically, we're being brought into the, discussion, the, uh, the discussions between the uh, Sewage Authority and the Internal Drainage Board um, because they, they, they have a responsibility to take it. And how the Sewage Authority deal with it is up to them. And we can't impose it upon them. The question is, should we be able to refuse the uh, application because they don't think we don't know, think the sewage authorities are going to be able to do it in a successful manner when they tell us they can. <laughs> we're putting an impossible position here uh, because we're being able to, asked to do, argue the internal damage sports concerns on, behalf, uh, on their behalf towards the sewage authority in, an, in a planning application. And I'm not sure this is the place that we should be doing it. Uh, I, I think the, there is an argument to make a discussion to be had about how they handle it. Uh, and we should be making representations. But I don't think we can refuse the planning application on these grounds when the statutory body which says it can should handle this says it can deal with it. And that's the problem. Uh, 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 and uh, so, uh, so that, that's the reason I don't think we can, I can re refuse it. It's not because I don't think there's a problem. It's because I don't think this is the place to argue that debate out. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Hawkins, please. Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of what I was thinking has been said by Councillor Khan. We have a situation where the statutory organisations have not provided an objection. However, we have also heard the concerns of SWIFT the IDP. And I am absolutely disappointed with Homes England and their consultants for the way they have failed to engage with SWIFT the IDP. And actually, before I make a decision. I think for me, I would like if the officers can actually give us uh, some advice on whether or not we can um, have additional conditions regarding the request that has been made by Swaves IDB. I know this is an outline planning commission and the reserve matter still has to come. But I would like to see something done to ensure that Swavesy is not put at the potential risk that it seems to be now. Um, we are here as a planning committee to uh, look at applications according to planning law. <laughs> there are things which I don't like, but I don't have a choice because the planning law is what it is. Um, the balance has to be struck, definitely. But I am, I, I, <laughs> I just want to make sure that we're doing the right thing at the same time as observing the planning laws to make sure that existing communities are not put at risk. That, for me, is the main issue right now. So if we can have some advice, either from legal or from officers, as to what it is we can do to ensure that SWIFT is not put at risk, then yes. You know, at least as a minimum, <laughs> a condition that we can go ahead with. Thank you. Let's see what officers have to say about that. 
Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, the, the, the situation um, that's been highlighted is, uh, and you heard from the applicants earlier on, the, the current site, obviously an undeveloped site, uh, water lands on it and runs off. Uh, and it runs off if it's not raining very heavily at different rates to if it's raining very, very heavily. The proposal um, that you've seen um, before you is to build attenuation ponds into this development and then to um, potentially re manage the discharge rates uh, from uh, the site uh, to a kind of an even plane. So three, um, uh, three litres uh, per metre per second, per, second. Hectare. Um, per hectare. So um, uh, you've going, going from an unmanaged uh, surface water response to a managed surface water response. The um, uh, IDB, uh, I think, indicated that their concern in this case is that um, if, for example, uh, the um, conditions in the, in the use prevent the discharge of water, uh, then um, there may well be a risk of um, uh, water uh, building up in the Swavesy drain and flooding local properties. But that risk exists at this moment in time with the unregulated water environment that, it, that this land amounts to. What is being proposed um, is either through agreement and through the process with the IDB and others, a mechanism to accelerate the release of that captured surface water to take advantage of the capacity in the Swavesy drain before the, um, uh, uh, before the uh, uh, outlet is closed, uh, or alternatively an ability to hold uh, an estimated quantity of water based on a 1 in 200 years plus 40%, which is above the national standard of 1 in 100 years plus 40% for climate change um, uh, rainfall event. Uh, you've heard that there isn't agreement uh, and concern particularly from the IDB about the lack of connectivity and the monitoring of that situation. So the IDB talked about um, uh, telemetry or kind of monitoring systems that two sites in Swayze currently utilize. Um, I think it was implied in the planning conditions that the issue about how that water is released from the site is managed. And in fact, condition 34 on th surface water uh, in your um, packs attempts to try and manage that particular point given that the circumstances in some cases may well justify holding the water uh, on site, for example, if the outlet is closed, or indeed may justify rapidly releasing that water to help manage the, the, the other impacts on the Swayze drain from uh, delayed discharges on other sites. So in terms of is it reasonable to refuse planning permission for this development, I think the applicants made the point, and I think it's a matter of fact, that the proposals will make matters no worse than a greenfield runoff rate, um, which is the existing circumstances. Uh, and in policy terms, your policies, the uh, SPD for uh, uh, Cambridgeshire, um, and indeed the NPPF, requires um, applications to make matters no worse. That's the limit, in fact, of what you should be doing. However, the policy also encourages improvements or making things better. Uh, and the ability to manage by holding water on the site, the release of surface water that would otherwise fall into the Swayze drain through the natural process of groundwater drainage, uh, the applicants argue it is a betterment. Uh, Councillor Williams highlighted, uh, and um, I think Councillor Khan also highlighted, that however, in addition to that surface water flow is foul water uh, and the way in which foul water is, is managed. That is the responsibility of Anglian Water. The licensing of the discharge of that foul water into the Swayze drain is the responsibility of the Environment Agency uh, and the IDB's responsibilities set out in legislation and working in concert with EA and Anglian Water is to manage that. It is not the primary responsibility of the Planning Authority. The water resources uh, legislation covers those uh, respective obligations. Um, what you are required to do is to have regard to the effect of granting planning permission on those circumstances. Uh, and Anglian Water and the Environment Agency have advised you 
that from both a treatment and a consenting process in terms of the discharge of that foul water into the swaves and drain, they are at this moment in time not objecting to the proposals. They're not objecting. What that means is, is that if you were minded to refuse the application on the basis that the scheme cannot proceed, then the appeal would need to be defended solely on the basis of the IDB's position. Um, and um, that position is that there, it's not that it's not possible to address this matter, which is the view of Anglian Water and will be part of the 2025 onwards asset um, investment plan from Anglian Water, is that they don't know that that is the case. Now, the ID bit and the calculations haven't been provided, which is disappointing in terms of the dialogue, as you've said. But if the consenting authority that permits the discharge of that treated foul water into the watercourse and has responsibility for flooding as well as the IDB, in other words, the Environment Agency, if they are not objecting to the proposals and the Water Treatment Authority is saying we are not uh, we are capable of addressing that. And it's not solely about Utton's Drove, it's about the other water treatment assets that they have at their disposal. Then it is hard to see that you have a sustainable reason for refusal that officers uh, and the local planning authority can point to uh, to justify refusal of the application. Instead, what you've got is a series of conditions which is obviously the process that you have to go through if before we refuse an application are conditions capable of mitigating that impact. And I think there are a couple of points in which the conditions that we have discussed and indeed the IDB um, representative also highlighted could be made more explicit around the way that surface water uh, is actively monitored, not just managed, uh, in order, uh, so condition 34 um, particularly, uh, in order to be able to um, address the, the points that they were making uh, around the need for telemetry and for early warning uh, and effective uh, collective management of that impact. So, Chair, I think you know, that I, I've heard uh, proposals or suggestions to amend Conditions 32 um, to introduce that uh, more explicit and overt requirement for monitoring uh, of and control of water at source uh, and condition 34 um, to include an element of active monitoring as opposed to kind of waiting and seeing but which relates to the telemetry point um, of uh, the temporary storage of water so that either it's released early in the process earlier than it would otherwise be released to assist in the effective management by the IDP and others of the Swayze drain or it's held on site so that it makes matters no worse than the existing circumstances. Uh, and, I, and I think, you know, the, 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 the technical bodies, um, uh, with the exception of the IDB, including the LLFA, who also have responsibility for managing flood risk and surface water, uh, are satisfied with, with those arrangements. Okay. Councillor Hawkins, wanted to come back? Uh, yes, please. So... Um, the request by Swayze IDB um, to be able to hold the water on the site when the, oh, whatever that sluice is, is closed. Is that something that could be added to condition 32? Or is it 34? Stephen? It, it's covered by condition 34 it, as far as I can see. Is it covered already? What, what, I, what, I would, what I would suggest is that after, in the third line of that condition, where it says, until a scheme for ten, temporary storage, so, uh, um, uh, after which we add active monitoring, which uh, goes to the point around telemetry and management of surface water on that parcel that has been submitted to and approved in writing. Um, and, uh, and I think um, adding that provision also, so that relates to uh, uh, development parcels, but I think if we can also add um, monitoring into condition 32 uh, in the uh, ahead of the um, schedule of requirements where it says each landscape element shall include within the second paragraph, um, uh, maximise, so the one, two, three, four, fifth line down, maximise use of measures to monitor 
and control water at source as far as practical. I think that it was it's written into the flood risk assessment, which is an incorporated document into the um, planning permission in the event mm. that permission is granted and which will frame the more detailed um, SUDS uh, appraisals on each scheme. Um, but, it, but I think those two changes serve to at least draw it more um, uh, overtly into the arena of consideration um, in each case, recognising Councillor Hale's point, we might not all be here. Okay, but that, that still doesn't, when, uh, when the drainage consultant said they, they didn't have the additional they didn't have this space for the additional, oh, what was the phrase? Gosh, please bear with me. <laughs> um, I think the statement was, There was no additional, what they have on the site now doesn't include any additional space for water when the sluice is closed. That, yeah. So I think, I don't know if officers want to come back on that, but I think they've given a view on what they think the conditions should, how we can condi work which, the conditions. Which is why I asked the question. <laughs> And Dean Harris said, yes, we're willing to consider having additional space, although it might affect the master plan. Do you remember? I mean, before we, as I said, before we decide anything, before we go to a decision or anything, we will be displaying all the amended and additional conditions on screen so everyone who is minded to approve uh, can be content with the conditioning, because as Stephen said earlier, this does need to be agreed now before we do make a decision on it. Um, okay, with that, members, I've just been reminded, actually, we do, bits of admin, we do need to agree to continue past the four-hour mark, given we've been here for more than four hours. So, members, okay. good, thank you very much. Um, okay, members, I will ask if anyone else has any more points they want to make in the debate, um, and then I think we've had points of view from both sides. I think after that, we will then go to uh, reasons for refusal and conditions should we approve. Councillor Bradman, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I th just referring to the point before, um, in the letter from the middle level commissioner engineer, it says if these discharges are allowed to occur, there will be a 25% increase in the design capacity of the design flows for Swavesey drain and the Webb's hole pump. The massive increase in cost cross catchment flows has not been modelled and the board are both surprised and angry if this has been approved. That's, I think, maybe relating to the point that we were concerned about. Um, however, I just wanted to, my actual question was related to um, maintenance, money for maintenance and who will be responsible. Now, I notice in 32 surface water reserve matters detail, on page 140 of the paper version, um, the strategy for each development parcel or strategic engineering and landscape element shall include things including F and a management and maintenance plan. And I just wanted to be sure that we have absolutely got it, that, that um, there will be a plan required in the reserve matters that will identify who is responsible for maintenance of the drainage infrastructure once it's been designed and built. Yes, Mr. Kelly. Um, the responsibilities for, who's, uh, uh, for maintenance and, and management of drainage infrastructure is set out in water resources legislation, not in planning legislation, and we can't usurp that. The responsibility is the IDB, Anglian Water, and um, uh, for, for that apparatus is covered. I appreciate that's for the sort of national infrastructure, but I was actually concerned about on the development, the, the where there is permeable paving and where there are suds. I want to have the management of those um, tied down closely. 
So there are certain adoption arrangements now. I think Anglian Water have taken on responsibility for things like adopting certain elements of the drainage um, system, including surface water suds schemes because of a national problem. Um, uh, Homes England are in the process of exploring the long-term management of all of the um, uh, North Stowe sites, including consideration of things like trusts and so on, but um, it will be addressed. For example, it would be extremely unfair if this responsibility landed on any town council. It, it would just be too big. Uh, resp you know, I'm sure they're very capable of taking it on their shoulders, but they won't have the money to pay for it. So, you know, I think we need to. Sure. So I think I think the point is when the reserve matters comes forward, it needs to be made clear who's responsible for with what. And I think that point has been noted by by officers. Um, okay. Good speakers. Thank you. Councillor Rickard. Um, this is probably more to do with questioning a question on condition. I'll do really really quickly. Back this morning, um, the Internal Drainage Board mentioned about a larger pump to assist with light water outflows. I just wondered if that was anything that's been taken on board as regards the conditions. Yeah, um, not sure if any officers want to come back on that. The question was around the IDB are making a recommendation for, that we condition a larger pump to cope with the increased development. I'm not sure we can condition that, but that's a question to officers. I, I don't think we have sufficient clarity on um, the size and format of that pump. And as I said, there are responsibilities on the IDB as the drainage body responsible for the swaves to drain to implement measures necessary, but they are also um, uh, a statutory body with that responsibility in the same way that we don't know the requirements on angling water for the water treatment works investment. The, 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 the difficulty in terms of, for example, if you were uh, to impose a 106 obligation would be the um, extent to which the provision of that pump was associated solely with this development as opposed to every other source of water in the Swayze drain that effectively utilises uh, the uh, pump itself for benefit. Uh, and so um, I think there would be a difficulty in terms of the community infrastructure levy regulations to attribute solely the cost of a pump to this development compared with every single other form of development or activity that generates a discharge into the Swayze drain. So the test of a section uh, of a section 106 is: is it reasonably related in scale and kind to the development? That's one of the statutory tests on a on a section 106 obligation. And I uh, defer to Stephen Reid, but I think it would be difficult to ascribe singularly uh, this development as a responsibility for that piece of additional infrastructure, such that we could quantify a cost, or indeed it would the cost would actually be sufficient to cover the replacement of the physical infrastructure. Can I come back after Stephen Reid? I don't know if Mr. I'm not sure if Mr. Reid wants to comment at all. In relation to the sill regs, uh, I think Mr. Kelly's point is absolutely right. The difficulty is account, um, you know, you, you didn't um, seek to recover um, a contribution from Phase 3A, so I think there are difficulties under the SIL regs about seeking to require an additional contribution from this phase. Um, so you're saying the, the cost of that would fall on the IDB if they decided at a later date that that was needed. However, we are talking about telemetry and mon active monitoring, so if that Active monitoring to me means that you don't assume something to necessarily be the case until you've measured it. So if if it was deemed like later that that would be a wise thing to do, have we missed the boat completely? Like, can that not be sort of implemented in any way later? Uh, there is already a contribution that came out of North Stowe at the beginning to Webb's Hole Sluice. But I, th but I think the point here is, is, is that at this moment in time, because Anglian Water and the Environment Agency haven't finalised the discharge arrangements, mm -hmm. so in terms of um, the process that Anglian Water, the Environment Agency, and one would hope the IDB 
will be engaged with over the next uh, 24 months or so, it is to assess the infrastructure requirements at Uttons Drove, to then work out whether or not the Environment Agency are prepared to consent to a certain level of discharge from that site into the Swavesy drain. Mm -hmm. And then obviously the implications on the Swavesy drain and Webb's whole sluice will then arise from that process. At this moment in time, there is nothing that we've got that allows us to quantify a process which the EA and Angling Water haven't concluded, mm -hmm. and in fact have only just very recently begun in order to be able to quantify that effect. As I said, there was um, a, a contribution built into the original 106 agreement for North Stoke to facilitate an upgrade. I think it was £128,000 or so. Um, but in this case, we haven't got a consented regime of discharge to be able to quantify the additional. Okay, thank you. Um, worth noting for the minutes, Councillor Richard Williams had to leave at 20 to 3, so he's no longer in the meeting. Councillor Heather Williams, please. Uh, thank you. Just some clarification from officers, please. So I think, and this was mentioned when, um, sorry, I've forgotten the gentleman's name, uh, spoke on behalf of the Internal Drainage Board, was about there, was, there were conditions that were allocated on phase one, two, and three A, and some sites within Swavesy that is not being conditioned on this site. So is that is that an oversight in relation, I think, to the new pump or something in obviously in relation to drainage, or is there a specific reason why it hasn't been done on this one site? Okay, I think Mr. Kelly's going to come back on that. Um, because of the scale of this scheme, perhaps it explains why the conditions that are on those two small sites in Swavesy, which were very explicit about telemetry, um, perhaps it hasn't come out. But we are intending for a similar arrangement to exist in terms of provision of telemetry. And my reference uh, in to the uh, changes to conditions 32 and 34 to make more, more clearer the requirement for monitoring in terms of... Um, the water levels of this development uh, were, ex were intended to capture that. Can I, can I make a suggestion that, because um, it's, it's very difficult for us as, as well about having the wording of that condition, that um, the, um, if committee has decided to approve this and it is subject to, you know, delegated and looking into, into other issues, if there is a, this condition that has been on all these other applications, mm. it, it does seem logical that we would apply it to this one as well. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and I accept sometimes, you know, things get missed and everything else. So I appreciate that. And it's a substantial document and everything else. But I think it, it does sound illogical to have applied it to bigger sites and smaller sites and not this one. So it, can we have that looked into if this is past um, and conditioned again like I was saying before about the transport I think the, the more consistent we are in the conditioning the more effective they are and um, so if we've got it on all the other phases can we have it on this one as well please sure okay I think we're as I said I don't think there's going to be an issue with that and obviously again we will go through all of the conditions in detail before we make a decision one way or the other on this um, just to make sure everyone's on the same page Okay. Uh, it, it, just to point out, in the letter, it does explain it here. It says the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Partnership has, this is the letter from the Swavesey Internal Drainage Board, from the middle level commissioner engineer, and he says, the Greater Cambridge Shared Planning Authority has previously imposed similar planning conditions on two sites in Swavesey Village. These are the ones that Mr. Wilderstone was talking about, including the Bloor Homes site on land southwest of Fendrayton Road, Swavesey, i.e. conditions four, surface water management, and five, sluice of planning permission. Oh, sorry, sluice of planning permission S231518 RM. And I think it's those conditions they're hoping would be applied in this case. Sure. Okay. I think officers have noted that. Um, I've got two more speakers, and then I'm going to try and round this up. Councillor Khan, then Harvey. <coughs> it's really, I just wanted more information. Um, we're, we're concerned about the, the, the sewage provisions that are planned. It's not clear, it's not, there's a concern that it might not work. That, um, 
that's not something that we are actually able to do anything about. But I, I, what I do wonder is in during the phasing the development, when we have the reserve matters, uh, uh, we have more information on the plans, are we able to um, Great, you know, speed, uh, decide the speed of its development in, in the light of the actual development progress is made on sewage provision uh, in the future. And should we make, be making conditions or perhaps a, an information point in, in the, if we gave permission? Okay, if officers want to comment. From the conversations we've had with Anglian Water, uh, as I said uh, earlier on, they're, they're undertaking their 2025 asset management planning for 2025 to 2030. They've indicated that they have capacity at this moment in time for treatment up until the middle of that um, time period, and that over the next 24 months, they'll be putting in place, together with the Environment Agency, um, uh, the next phase of plans, including, uh, and people have touched upon this, the way in which foul um, treatment is assigned to the suite of different sites in this locality. Uh, upon which they will then um, uh, plan their investment. Um, they haven't objected or said we need to put in place uh, any limitations on headroom at this moment in time in terms of treatment capacity. And the letter that was referred to, I think, earlier in the meeting by the Environment Agency, which did initially reflect a concern around that because of the assignment of untreated of foul water from Campbell West, um, from the conversations the Environment Agency have had with Anglian Water, they have also uh, indicated they, there is no need for a condition of that nature because they presumably have confidence in the treatment capabilities um, and the investment plans of Anglian Water. So there isn't an argument from the planning authority to introduce an obligation which is not required by the agencies responsible. But e even though we don't know what the position will be after 2030? Uh, it's because there's a process that they have to go through with over the next 24 months that will settle that, uh, unfortunately. That's the nature of the way the water industry works. Okay, thank you for that. And Councillor Harvey, please. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, th I think with this application, my, my main concern has been with, with the, the flood risk and mitigating that. Um, and I suppose I was slightly concerned um, when the developers made their presentation that um, in designing against the, the one and the 200 year event and, and then a margin on top of that, um, they hadn't perhaps taken into account um, the, the externalities or, or because they're outside of their control and um, particularly things such as a potential change in uh, the water level in the Great Ouse affecting it downstream. Um, rates and also um, climate change affecting the water table levels over an um, uh, extended period. Um, and, and those things feeding into how much capacity would be in those ponds um, when the 200 year event hits. In other words, that's no good if the pond is already half full perhaps. But I think I'm sort of um, comforted by what um, Stephen Kelly has told us about the, the meaning of the telemetry and uh, active management. I think um, the, the active management is quite a key thing in, in that relationship because it, it would enable um, management to anticipate the 200-year event. And therefore, I think perhaps if we could highlight the, the active management um, element in the conditioning, that, that would be very helpful. Um, aside from that, um, I apologise for my lateness committee. I think it would actually be wrong for me to vote on this because I did miss part of the uh, presentation. So... Um, I'll be abstaining. Right. Okay, members, I think we've had everyone uh, contribute to the debate now. So what I'm proposing on doing is going through, firstly, uh, any conditions that we were looking to amend or add to the application should permission be granted. And then after that, reasons for refusal should the committee uh, look to refuse this. So I'm going to ask Mr. Kelly if he would mind putting up on the screen the amended conditions as we've been discussing. Thanks, Chair. I'll try and share my um, screen to allow me to, to, to do that. It won't be a second. So um, 
these are amendments to the conditions, um, and there's one additional condition that um, was suggested by uh, that references Councillor Williams's point. Um, uh, and I put in capitals in red uh, the um, suggested amendment. So this is condition 32. Um, this is page 140 of the agenda. Thank you. Um, where I think the, the objective was around um, maximising the use of measures to monitor and control water at source. Um, now, Councillor Williams made a point around, well, could you not just replace, replicate, I think Councillor Bradman maybe not replicate the conditions on the Bloor scheme in Swayze, which I'm familiar with. Um, but this is more about a, a, lo a much larger development. It's about 10 times the size, and hence the reason for the, for the um, incorporation of that into uh, this strategy, um, rather than um, a separate condition. We could expand upon that, um, but there would be a degree of duplication if we were to use the Bloor Homes condition and this one. So, um, Chair, it's up, to, it's up to the committee whether or not they delegate to me to encapsulate that Bloor Homes condition um, explicitly referring to telemetry, um, which I don't have in front of me, or whether or not um, they're satisfied that the um, monitoring uh, uh, and control of water source uh, is a component of it. If I just move on to the end of that, because there's another point where this point around active monitoring is captured, um, and um, uh, I'll come back to the use at the point around paving. Um, but on condition 34, um, uh, there were two points raised, um, but the active monitoring and management of surface water on that parcel references back to condition 32, and then the, to, the point around telemetry. Um, there's a separate point here, which is that Councillor Hawkins uh, was asking whether we could address the opportunity uh, within the, that the applicants identified to optimise the capacity of that storage facility. Um, and I think that's a potential way of um, capturing that ambition. Um, if I then return to the point that was made around drainage early in our discussions this morning, um, uh, I'm suggesting that you could expand, although it's covered in the flood risk assessment, which I said is a document that's captured in the permission, in the um, uh, planning application, um, uh, the particular concerns that were raised around permeable paving and associated uh, sustainable urban drainage design considerations could be captured, I, I suggest, by uh, changing to part B of, of, of that condition. So, Chair, I don't know whether you want me to move on to the construction management plan, but is there any... Uh, I think as drainage is probably the main concern I've heard raised, do any members want to make any comments on those proposed changes to conditions? Councillors Bradman, then Hales, then Hawkins. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to remind us what we're asking for that monitoring for, the, the point was that... Um, in the IDB letter, it said the suggested higher discharge rates um, came with the caveat that an exemplar Swave Sea drain management maintenance regime was in place in perpetuity with a storage system on the development. So you've covered that. But it was linked by telemetry to the Webb's Hole sluice to prevent discharge when the sluice is closed. And I just wondered whether it would be useful to have just that wording about the telemetry to prevent discharge when the sluice is closed, because that's the whole point of it. Maybe the people feel sure. that's I mean, self-evident. Um, but... I'm sure the officers will confirm, but I don't think that will be an issue, including that in the condition. Um, officers, if you'd like to confirm that. No, that's fine. With your, with your agreement, we can certainly encapsulate that within the, um, uh, more explicitly within the condition itself. Sorry, I haven't done that today. Okay. Um, our Councillor Hales, please. To the Chair, through you, to Mr Kelly. On your, I think it's, is it further up on the screen? Um, you talked about a plan being put forward together, but no, no development should take place. I think that's what it was, wasn't it? What was the wording for that? It was to do with the, the earlier part, 32, was it? Either way, basically, a plan should be put in place 
yeah, before any development commences. Are we permitted to put in there and the, the strategy for delivery? Because if you remember one of the speakers earlier said that there's lots of stuff in the plans, but none of it's been delivered on, on, on bits and pieces. So I'd kind of quite like if we could nail down developers, especially around this particular subject, that um, they will deliver it perhaps either before the houses are, are occupied or whatever, you know, a bit like infrastructure. Thanks. I think Mr. Kelly's going to respond. Yeah, um, uh, it, it might not be clear, but um, the way that, uh, because this is a large outline with lots of reserve matters and lots of phases, the requirement, the way the conditions are crafted is to make sure that the requirement is for that phase, that it implements the measures as they're approved. But by necessity, there may well be several applications for effectively the same condition, res respective of each phase. And so the way that, the way that um, certainly around drainage, uh, it's being dealt with, it, uh, you can see on the screen, the development of each development and landscape shall be carried out in accordance with the approved details. So no, um, so no building pursuant to that development parcel for which approval is sought shall be occupied until such time as the approved detailed surface water measures have been fully completed. So the objective there is to make sure that we, we cover that implementation point off. Um, there was a wider point that that gentleman highlighted around other amenities and other facilities, uh, and that is covered by um, Condition 12 uh, and a what's called Secondary Mixed Use Zone Development Framework. That was a snazzy title that we came up with, I think, um, but effectively requires uh, that the um, reserve matters uh, for that phase sets out how it's going to be implemented and so on to try and make sure that there's a phasing uh, agreed around it. Phasing on it. Through you, Chair. T to be fair, it was the amenity probably takes second place in my head with regards to the infrastructure and the civil engineering required to make sure people don't get wet feet. Uh, Councillor Hawkins, do you want to make a point? Um, yes, I did. I think for me, the the word monitor doesn't is not specific enough in that I don't see where it says it's telemetry. They can monitor it in some other way that they might think up. Um, is there any way to make it more specific? And also. Uh, we talk about the surface water thing being agreed. Well, agreed by whom? With whom? Is there any way of ensuring that Swiss EIDB actually is part of this agreement? Stephen, uh, I, I I think we can we can firm up and expand upon this uh, monitoring point as you see on the, on the screen um, uh, to reference uh, remote sensing, for example, as a as an example. But if you can delegate the word of that, recognising the um, IDB's reference to the Bloor Homes condition, I'm happy to have a look at the two of them. Uh, in terms of, um, uh, I think, including the IDB, um, uh, there are limitations. Or, the, the requirement is that the Planning Authority approves conditions. There's no other um, requirement. Um, obviously, as part of this particular, these conditions, we would be consulting the IDB uh, on those measures because as the flood risk assessment highlights that three-way dialogue between the EA and um, the Planning Authority and the IDB is an important part of how we would determine whether those measures were acceptable. So I should include the LLFA as well as four ways. So I don't think there's a need to require it in consultation with the IDB. For it to be a reasonable condition, it has to be discharged by the Planning Authority. Uh, and um, I don't know whether Stephen Reid wishes to comment, but authorities that have sought to incorporate third party approvals into conditions have sometimes come unstuck with that process. Okay. Um, um, Councillor Harvey, is this on the wording of the conditions? Yeah, thank you, Chair. I, ju I just wondered if it's, is, is it possible to incorporate into conditions that um, just following on from my previous comments, that 
there is sufficient capacity to absorb the 200-year event. Um, is, is, is that a condition that's possible to put on? Um, you know, in, in terms of there's an ongoing responsibility to maintain a volume, a collection volume um, available to absorb that 200-year event. It is the design parameters that the flood risk assessment are built upon, uh, and therefore is captured in the in in the um, application, and thereby would be captured in the planning permission where one grant is. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so Stephen, I don't know if you wanted to go on to the next set of conditions. I think there's one someone transport. Yes. Yeah, so um, the the. Uh, uh, apologies. Um, we had a, num uh, a wide ranging discussion around the construction environment management plan, which is condition 39. Um, and I think concerns around two elements uh, in that um, condition. The first was around um, Council Wilson's uh, comments around control systems to manage um, uh, not just uh, access and egress, but actually the routing of, of, of those vehicles. You can see it does already uh, include um, temporary hall routes, but um, the suggestion is that by supplementing Part C with um, highway signage strategy, uh, inserting control systems, I'll put them in capitals, but just so it stands out, uh, uh, and approach to monitoring and enforcement. And I noted the comments around um, uh, the discussion around should we be explicit in preventing heavy construction vehicles associated with development from using unsuitable roads through local villages, whether that needed to be said, um, but I've suggested it could be captured uh, through the condition if that was um, the um, committee's wishes. Uh, I think that's all, that's the only change that I'm proposing to condition 39. Okay, Councillor Wilson, please. I'm just wondering about the use of unsuitable, because that's open to um, interpretation. <laughs> It's very subjective. Um, yeah, un understood. I'm just going to see what officers' thoughts are on potentially using a different adjective. My, my colleague's suggesting we say residential, but we've heard that the main high road through Swayze is an all-use road. Um, I think it's difficult for us to be explicit in a condition in terms of um, uh, a, a definition I'm open to suggestions. Obviously, the, the, mani the construction management plan itself is looking, as, as Tam Perry's highlighted, to manage vehicle routings. Uh, and um, I think the purpose of including this form of wording was clearly there's a matter of judgment on what's a suitable or unsuitable road. But there may well be circumstances where there may well be an only road that can be used, even if it is perhaps of a substandard width or other parameters that we might try to, to use. I think the objective is to be clear about driving um, all construction traffic onto the higher order roads, so the A roads and the uh, and the trunk road network. Okay, uh, Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think the problem we have here is we know there are definitely some villages that have had severe problems with construction vehicles, delivery vehicles traveling through them, sometimes in the middle of the night. Um, you know, causing potential problems to some of those uh, houses along the road. Uh, we've had Willingham uh, over. And I mean, I do remember having to call uh, a meeting of all the developers on phase one and having an, uh, an agreed way to do the monitoring, which LNQ was supposed to have put in place, which they still haven't put in place. So we need to do something, make sure that we put something in now that will prevent this happening. Specific roads need to be, need to, or villages need to be identified. I'm sorry, we, we do. I don't know if officers have any further comments on that, do they? I think the slight, I mean, as, as Tam Perry's highlighted, through the transport assessment work, we've highlighted a range of potential impacts that, uh, and, a, and an area of influence in terms of surrounding roads. Uh, and um, the, the transport assessment does discuss the potential implications for a number of those villages. Uh, I think in, in potentially eight to 10 years time, this development isn't due to complete until 2035 or something like that. 
um, the circumstances and the dynamics might be slightly different. And so the very last phases, we might have a different view about the assignment of traffic and so on. I think in, in some respects, we'll have to adapt and evolve that. There are, through the design measures for traffic calming that we discussed earlier on and Council Bradnam highlighted, there is an expectation of active monitoring that will allow for investment in all vehicle traffic calming measures um, over the uh, over the uh, life of the development. Um, but we could, there's no problem to list every village that we think at the moment will be impacted, but the danger is, is you then exclude villages that might be impacted in ways that are more remote, but which we don't know about at the moment. Councillor Bradman. Thank you. Could I just suggest um, a form of words around priority? So could we not say something along the lines of um, wherever possible, the routes should be along the A14, B1050 um, as a priority, unless no other alternative uh, is possible. You know, so we do it as a, as a priority order. So A roads, unless no B road is available, something like that. Okay, um, I see we actually have uh, someone from the Highways Authority, Jess Tuttle, who's indicated he wishes to speak to us on this matter. Mr Tuttle? Um, I was just going to say, uh, my suggestion for this would be that if you put um, control system and approach to monitoring and enforcement to prevent heavy vehicles associated with the development from using roads otherwise indicated in the construction management plan. So what you then do is you would draw the roads out that we want them to use, i.e. the B1050 and the A14. Then we would say you will only use those, ro those roads. Then if the construction management plan needs updating at some point, you know, because there's a change in circumstances, we can then tie that back to the routing in the plan. I think that will probably be a sort of acceptable way for members from what I've heard so far. Councillor Wilson, do you want to come back on that? So then in order to bring Cottenham within that um, catchment, I would like to see the A10 in there as well, because it's very easy for HGVs to go along the A14 and then mat run down the B1049 through Cottenham to cut off the corner going to Water Beach. Okay, I think that is acceptable to include as well. Thank you. So, on okay, so we don't have the exact wording on the screen, but as the gentleman from the County Council has just indicated, plus, um, plus the inclusion of the A10 in that as well, I think that's the proposal that we delegate officers to go away and alter the condition should we vote to approve this today to read as that. Um, Councillor Ripeth and then Williams. I think my point just been articulated by Councillor Wilson and the gentleman before. Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you. I think um, the the wording actually might, that the um, officer from the County Council just suggested, because I think it is a valid point. We need to make sure this is future proofed. It's so so long. We could have an expressway, we could have anything going along in the, in the near future in that area. All sorts of things could change. We could even, I don't know, have rail that means it arrives by train. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Um, so what I'm saying is we don't know really when this is going to finish. So we need to make sure, we, I don't think we can be so prescriptive. And I was just going to suggest um, through local villages, especially um, in residential or special care within residential areas or something like that, just to then that gets across our point that it is those residential settlements that we're most concerned about. Um, my, my point about road repairs um, for any roads that are used, is that encompassed in there? I'm, I'm just going to ask it rather than try and find it. Uh, Stephen, I don't believe so, but... It's, it, it isn't incorporated in it, but there are provisions in the Highways Act for the Highway Authority to be able to um, uh, investigate and resolve those matters. Many people say they haven't always done so, but it's not necessarily something we can um, easily capture in the planning condition for the depth, width, the, the extent of this particular um, uh, scheme impact. 
I think actually we have the highways officer who wants to come back in again, Jez. Apologies. I was just going to say that for the very localised roads, um, what we've done before is we've put a condition on saying a pre pre commencement survey is undertaken to look at the uh, the condition of the road, um, and then one is taken. And this I know this is a long time, but or taken at intervals where the road is condition surveyed to see whether there's actually been any degradation um, as a result of as, as a result of construction traffic. That might be something that could be considered in this case. Councillor Williams. Councillor Williams. Can I can I suggest that because on other issues I have to say I've I've always found it important to have that baseline and that reference point back so we know what's happened. We've had that in other issues where we've wanted to take action, but we don't have a comparable. We don't have a comparison, so I think that's really important to include. Okay, Mr. Kelly, um, I think. Sorry, I think the pre-commencement survey, absolutely, um, I can add into, into this. Um, it, it will be quite challenging in terms of ascribing degradation of the um, network on a scheme as big as this over this period of time to solely the development. But if it assists the Highway Authority in um, their enforcement process, then certainly putting in a um, perhaps a, an addition to um, the construction management plan um, to require pre-commencement survey of the local highway network um, is something that we can add with, with your agreement to this condition. Sure. Okay. Councillor Bradham. And could that include the five culverts on Ramfer Road? I'm not sure any comments on including the culverts. Uh, I, I think we can review the highway. Um, obviously, the Highway Authority is responsible for the culverts, um, uh, and so the pre-commencement survey can, I'm sure, capture those obvious elements that form part of the public highway. Because they form part of the sustainable drainage network. Do you remember? They, they, were the ex, they were the outflow from Uttons Drove and the two outflows from the um, surface water drainage schemes that went through those culverts. So ensuring that that water gets away was, was crucial to the success of the upstream at 3B. Yeah, the, the responsibility for maintaining those culverts is the responsibility of the county council, though, not the developer. Um, and so we can do a precondition survey. I absolutely understand the significance of the drainage network. Um, but in some respects, we need to draw some lines about where the developer survey stops because the foul sewers and all manner of other bits of infrastructure may well be impacted. But if we can capture in the highways pre-commencement survey the condition of the main drains on either side and the culverts and we will um, aim to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, were there any other conditions on your form, Stephen? Uh, the only other condition that I had was um, Councillor uh, Heather Williams suggested an alternative, uh, an additional condition or um, in respect to the point that Councillor Williams was making around the um, restriction of building heights along the B1050, um, uh, this was a potential condition that would, I think, address that concern. Sorry, I haven't got the drawing reference number in front of me, but, um, uh, and you'll forgive me for the spelling, so sorry, whilst I was talking, I wasn't spell checking. Um, but um, I, it certainly reserves the provisions of the parameter plan, uh, and the drawing I was referring to in that XXX is the building heights parameter plan. Um, uh, in order to uh, capture um, the buildings facing onto that. Okay. that so essentially, it's a condition limiting the height of buildings on the edge of the B1050 to two stories. Uh, members, is, is everyone uh, happy to include that? This is a new condition. We're not editing an old one. This is a new condition. Do any members not want this to be included? No? Okay. So I think we'd like to include that, please, Stephen. Um, Members, I think that's all the conditions officers have picked up. Are there any that have been discussed during debate? And I haven't made any notes of these, but are there any further conditions that members wish to add or equally edit? No, I don't think so. 
Okay, with that then, we will now also have to look at, because some members said they are looking, they would be voting against this, we need to go through reasons for refusal. Um, I think the main reason I had down was environmental reasons, predominantly around drainage and sewerage, um, but I think we need to um, vocalise those. So I'm probably looking at officers here to help me with that, if that's possible. I think, I think the um, objections that I heard from, um, I think, Councillor Roberts particularly and Councillor Williams around um, uh, the implications of surface water drainage related to policy CC9 of the local plan, which is about managing flood risk, and it was the risk of flooding that was um, driving Councillor Roberts' concern, I think, in terms of why the application was unacceptable. Um, so it would, it, it, I haven't got a form of precise words to share with you on the screen, unfortunately. Um, but I think the reason would be uh, on the basis of the failure of the scheme to uh, ensure that uh, uh, risks of flooding in nearby, um, uh, in Swavesey, uh, had not been adequately mitigated through the design of the uh, surface water uh, infrastructure uh, and in the absence of clarity around the treatment of foul water and its discharge into Swayze Drain. Does that capture the I think that's concern? Wendell Chairman, as well, could we say as well, the fact is that what one of my concerns is, and other people I think have the same view, uh, of our concerns that um, such uh, little um, consultation had taken part um, with um, the uh, land drainage people, um, you know, nothing since 2019. So I don't know whether you could add that, that, that there's been far too little um, actual consultation amongst and, and discussion amongst the, the important parties. Uh, I don't think that's a reason, that's part of the reason for refusal. Obviously, it would go to any planning appeal or um, public inquiry as a uh, perhaps basis for the IDB's concerns. Okay, members, so with that one reason for refusal, should we vote to refuse? Are there any further reasons that members who are thinking of refusing would like it refused on? No, okay. Well, with that, members, I think we're at the time when we need to make a vote, take a vote on this. So I'm going to ask Aaron if he could set up the vote, please. So members, we're voting on whether to approve or refuse this application and for these are the reasons just outlined and if you're voting to approve with the conditions as amended and added. So members, if you press the blue button to register you're here, the green button to vote in favour of approval, red to vote against, and yellow to abstain. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we're missing one more. The vote hasn't come up on okay. my microphone. Right, so. we'll, we'll hold on till it's rectified. Yep, okay, we're going to rerun the vote then because of a technical issue. So, members, same again, blue button to register, you're here. Okay, members, we, sh we should be there now. So, blue button to register, you're here. Green button to vote in favour of the of the developments, red against, and yellow to abstain. Now mine isn't working. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm just assuming here. Uh -huh. I've got I've got a human finger. Oh, he's not Jeff, have you abstained or not voted? 
So you voted abstain. Okay. Okay, we're going to go old school. We're going hands in the air. <laughs> okay, members, those for the third time, those in favour of the development, please show your hands. Two, three, four, five, six, seven in favour, those against, sorry, eight in favour, those against, two, and one abstention. So it's, it should be seven, four, two against, and one abstention. <laughs> Okay, members, we're voting. Uh, we're going to vote on this again for the final time. Hands nice and high in the air, please. Okay, members, if you'd like to vote in favour of the application, please show your hands. And Aaron, you can count. Seven, four. Those against? Two against. And abstentions? One abstention. Good. Okay. So that application is, after a bit of faffing about, approved. Okay, everyone, thank you very much for your patience today. Thanks to all those that took part uh, in line, online and in person. Um, members, I think the only thing left to note is our next meeting is next week, uh, Wednesday the 9th. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much, everyone. See you all then. <laughs>